Well, our next speaker in our conference, we've taken full advantage to have him be available here for Sunday morning. Walid Shubat is going to be again speaking at 4 o'clock, as I was mentioning earlier. A little bit of an introduction before Walid comes out and shares. Like his Savior Jesus Christ, Walid Shubat was born in Bethlehem. Not too many people can boast that. Walid was a former PLO terrorist. I think some of you have heard his story before, either on CNN or Fox News or right here at this church in times past. He discovered that the Jews and Israel of the Bible were not someone to be hated, but when he picked up the Bible, and you hear about, you'll hear about that today, how God began to speak to him from his word, God's word. He has appeared on numerous broadcasts around the world. For us, most familiar, Fox News and CNN. He has a keen understanding of the Bible. Listen, a keen understanding of the Bible, and most interesting, and one that we may need to pay close attention to, is that of a Middle Eastern background. Ladies and gentlemen, our Savior Jesus came from the Middle East. Remember that. Though Walid was formerly a Muslim and a terrorist, he's come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Now, his teaching today will demand that you have your Bible open. If you didn't bring a Bible, act like you have one, because you're going to need it today. And many of the things that we have westernized in Scripture... Walid's going to be bringing to you from the Middle Eastern view. And I've got to tell you, you will be stimulated, pay close attention, excellent Bible teacher, man of God. I love this dear brother. So please give a warm Calvary Chapel welcome to Walid Shubat. Thank you. I heard somebody say something. Huh? Bless you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, brother. I get a lot of blessings when I go to church. I say when I go speak at university events, uh, whoever hosts me there, they never feed me. When I go to Jewish events, they forget to feed me. When I go to Christian events, they overfeed me. It's great to be here. I remember last time I was here, I had to watch the video to make sure what I talked about because uh, I have about a hundred things to talk about. I can talk about 400 hours straight and never finish because the wealth of the scripture is so rich. Uh, and I always regret it every time I leave a speaking event because I say, boy, I sit down on the airplane and I look at my notes. I forgot to tell them this and I forgot to tell them that and I didn't tell them about this and that. I didn't do my job right and I always, I'm always feeling bad as a Christian, you know. As a Christian, you should always feel bad. I know you should, they tell you you should feel good all the time. You can go to Joel Olstein and listen to this negative, positive messages. And then you're supposed to be positive no matter what. Uh, but no, not so for a Christian because I think there's two kinds of people in the world. There is the bad people who always think they are good. If you ask a person who's going to hell, uh, basically they tell you, I'm basically a good person. I know, I pay my taxes, I obey the traffic laws, you know. That's what they always tell you. You talk to a Christian, he always says, I'm not good enough. I didn't do enough. Boy, I'm unworthy. I need to work harder in my life. See, those are the good people who always think they're bad. The bad people always think they're good, and the good people always think they're bad. And I learned from the Bible when I began to study the Bible in 1993 that everything is in reverse, really. That God thinks in reverse of the world, and the world thinks in reverse of God. So when they see what God says and proclaims, it seems to be very strange to them. I mean, a woman, virgin, giving a, a birth to a child, and... His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. It doesn't make any sense. He becomes the Redeemer of mankind. That he dies and it is God himself taking himself a body of a man, dying on the cross on the behalf of everybody. Whoever wants to believe in this shall not perish but have everlasting life. What a simple message. What a true message. But it doesn't make any sense. How could it be that somebody can die on the behalf of my sins? After all, they're my sins, not his sins. From a world perspective, 
the gospel message doesn't really make any sense. But from the Bible it does. By the time I read the Bible, I began to make sense of everything around me. I began to see that every day I participate in a ritual that we all participate in. Every human on earth participates in this ritual once, twice, or three times a day. And that is eating food. We all eat food. We all kill an animal that is innocent, that had nothing to do with my hunger. What is it the cow's fault to die because I'm hungry? It had nothing to do with me being hungry. It is innocent. It is my fault that I'm hungry, not its fault. Yet it dies, an innocent animal dies, and innocence always must die in order for us to be sustained. Life can never continue unless an innocent dies. Always. So we have a whole world that rejects the gospel message. They reject the idea of somebody interceding on your behalf. If you reject the idea that an innocent must die on your behalf, then stop eating. Stop eating and maybe you can perish and leave us alone. But the problem today, especially in the West, that I go speak out all over this country, this great nation, and I get into the airports and I look at these books that are on the shelves and I see books galore. You know, you got uh, Christopher Hitchens, uh, God is not great. Well, I don't know. I mean, he should have a problem with his name. His name is Christopher, which means Christ bearer. I mean, he should have a problem with his name. He should change his name. You, you see books like by Richard the Dawkins, uh, the God delusion. That we as Christians are all diluted. We're deluding ourselves. You know, the Christians are always the problem. It's interesting that all these books is simply poking and picking on only the Christians. I can imagine Christopher Hitchens having the guts to write a book, Allah is not great. I don't know why they never write such a book. How come I'm the only one that's saying Allah is not great? But they tell you that we all worship the same God. That we as Christians, we are divisive. We are a stickler over this whole thing about only Jehovah is the true God. I mean, all gods are the same. We all worship the same God. Even going to a restaurant and sitting down and the waitress would come. I mean, I was with my manager, Keith. I remember, it was a few weeks ago. Remember the lady, the waitress? She comes over and we begin to talk about religion. She says, oh, we all worship the same God. I mean, such a unifying creed. You feel embarrassed to say nothing, you know. You can't say, oh, no, we don't worship the same God. What? You're divisive. Well, you call me divisive again, you're not going to get a tip. <laughs> but that's how they look at you. You're divisive. You sound divisive because what is to God really is opposite than the world views things. It's opposite than the logic of the world. You are divisive. How could you say that Allah and God are different gods? You must be an Islamophobe as well. You're an Islamophobe. Well, if God and Allah are the same and... Well, if God and Allah are the same and all gods are the same of the God Buddha and everything else is the same, all lumped up, you know, together with one deity, then can I go to a place where they worship Satan and they say, Hail Satan! And I say, excuse me, can I get into your congregation and say, Hail Jehovah! They'll throw you out. If Allah and God are the same, can I maybe take a poster with me and take a trip to Mecca? And my poster will say, Allah, Jehovah, Buddha, we all worship the same God. And carry it in Mecca. I know you Americans are not used to what I'm talking about here. You think, well, Mecca, big deal, he can go to Mecca and carry a poster. Before you get to Mecca, Mecca, big deal, he can go to Mecca and carry a poster. Before you get to Mecca, there is a big sign on the freeway, four arrows, you know, the big fat lanes. It says, Lil Muslimina Fakat, which means only Muslims. And there is a little arrow on the right, very narrow lane, 
that says non-Muslims. So if you want to take on my challenge, you want to go to Mecca and carry a big poster that says we all worship the same God, Allah, Buddha, Jehovah, whatever. May I suggest that you take that, fat, that narrow lane and take that exit very quickly. Because if you go take the wide lane and you go to Mecca, by the time you take your poster out and they see you, that Allah and Jehovah are the same God, boy, you're going to get your head on a pendulum, crescent-shaped pendulum, you know, and it's going to fly rolling. But you know, some say that when you're decapitated, you can still hear. Maybe you remember my words, and then you invite Jesus in your heart. <laughs> Don't worry that your torso is separate from your head. God will unite the two together in the end when you rapture. But we don't worship the same God. It is totally a different God. Because by the time I began to look at the scripture and look at the definition of who God is in the Bible, I began to see that your God is totally opposite from my God. I began to see that your devil was my Allah. And my Allah was your devil. Simply the name is switched a little bit is in disguise. I began to study the verses regarding Antichrist and boy I was crushed. I found out that my Mahdi, my Messiah, the spirit of Muhammad when he comes again, that was your Antichrist. After all, by the time I read Daniel and it talked about well how do we recognize the Antichrist? The Bible tells the sheep that he will bring seven years of peace. He will usher in seven years of peace. I said, boy, our Mahdi is in their Bible. How nice. In Islam, we believe that the Mahdi will usher in the last seven years that is remaining in the world. Then that's it, it's the end of the world. And the same thing with the book of Daniel, the last seven years the Antichrist ushers in the seven years, and in the midst, he will break the treaty with Israel. In Islam, it was the same thing. He breaks the treaty. The Mahdi breaks the treaty because the stones in the trees will cry out. There is a Jew hiding behind me. Remember the hadith? I shared it with you last time. Muhammad said, the day of judgment shall not come to pass until the tribes of Islam defeat the tribes of Israel in Jerusalem and the surrounding nations. And then the trees will cry out and the stones will cry out. There is a Jew hiding behind me. Come, O Muslim. Come, O servant of Allah. Come and decapitate him. Cut his head off. And the Western Christians, when they read their Bibles, they go through the verses so quick that they miss all kinds of things. And I saw the martyrs who were beheaded in the name of Jesus. Every jot and every tittle in the Bible must be fulfilled, including the beheading part. Everything. But I began to see that I was on the wrong side. God in the Bible loves Jews. Allah hates Jews. J double O double O Z. He loves Jews, and over there he hates Jews. I began to see that Islam as a religion came as a polemic. It really came for one reason and one purpose alone. Here's the purpose of Islam. The purpose of Islam is to destroy the concept that God is a trinity, to destroy the concept that Jesus died on the cross, to destroy the concept that Israel is God's chosen nation and people. That's it. Look at the whole Quran, look at the whole Hadith. Everything evolves around this whole concept. The Quran says, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ اللَّهُ الصَّمَدْ لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدٌ God does not beget any sons. He's not been begotten, neither he begets. He has no son. The Trinity in Islam is an anathema. 
Just as you have in the Bible, the denial of the Holy Spirit is an anathema. Islam's Holy Spirit is the angel that visited Muhammad. He took upon himself a title that belongs to God because the Holy Spirit is really, in definition, is God himself, part of the Trinity. The angel that met with Muhammad called himself Gabriel. He also called himself the Holy Spirit. It was called, you know, the, he, there is another angel that came to Muhammad calls himself Al-Buraq. It is a flying being, sort of an angel kind of thing, that ascended Muhammad into heaven. Muhammad ascended into heaven to meet up with the you know, host of all the other angels and to meet with the prophets and the patriarchs of the Bible and things like that. Why was it necessary for Muhammad to ascend unto heaven? Because he wanted to fulfill what Jesus did. Only Jesus ascended to heaven. He came from heaven and he ascended to heaven. Most Americans, when they read the Bible, they look at the five eyes. I will be like God. I will ascend into heaven. I will go. Those are the same things that the Antichrist is talking about. Because if you look at Isaiah 14, Isaiah 14 in reality, I hope you brought your Bibles with you. A soldier without a stinger missile is very ineffective. Look at Isaiah 14, because the West, when they look at these things, they say, well, this is the pride of the devil. This is when Satan was proud. This is the five eyes. But they don't look at this in context. Verse 12, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. O Hilal ibn Sahar, in the Hebrew. Hilal ibn Sahar, the Hebrew, go to the Hebrew, is really a name for this person that he is addressing. Hilal is an Aramaic word, Hebrew. Uh, uh, it's also Arabic word. Uh, anybody speaks Arabic here? I know Kamal speaks Arabic. Kamal, what is Hilal? Crescent. Crescent. Son of the morning star. That's his nickname. His nickname, oh, Crescent, brightness, the moon. Son of the morning star. Then he goes to the five eyes. I will ascend, verse 13, into heaven. That's what you proclaimed. You proclaim that you ascended into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. The stars, what are stars? Stars allegorically are angels. I will become above stars. Stars allegorically are angels. I will become above all angels. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will be like the Most High. And then look at verse 16. If this is Lucifer in his angelic form and his rebelliousness in heaven, then tell me, what do you do with verse 16? Verse 16 says, those who see you after he's captured will gaze at you and consider you saying, is this the what? The man who made the earth tremble. Earth to America. This is not talking about just the devil in his rebelliousness. This is talking about the Antichrist himself. Reading this as a Muslim is much more shocking than it is for you as a Westerner. Because as a Muslim, I came from the alien world. I feel like Captain Spock. I know how the aliens think, but I'm coming here to tell all the Captain Kirks what is the problem that they don't understand this manuscript and those parts of the manuscript is regarding us, the aliens. So Captain Spock to Captain Kirk, open your ears. Is this the man who made the earth tremble? Speaking of the Antichrist, but as a Muslim, we believe that the spirit of the Mahdi when he comes to usher in those seven years in which the end will be the, the destruction of all the Jews, in that spirit, what we believed is that this is Muhammad coming, is Muhammad coming back again. Because Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, he says the Mahdi will come. He will have my spirit. It's the same person. I know most Westerners think, when they think of this thing called Mahdi, they think of Ahmad and Nijad coming to the United Nations. Ahmad and Nijad spoke at the United Nations. 
And he was talking about the ushering of the Mahdi. This is not theory anymore. They're talking about this stuff. And you might think, well, this is the 12th Imam thing. Most Americans ask me these questions all the time. What is this 12th Imam thing? Forget the 12th Imam thing. There's different schools of thoughts regarding the Mahdi within Shia. But let me tell you something. Every Shia and every Sunni in the world believes in the coming of the Mahdi. The belief in the coming of the Islamic Mahdi is as the belief for a Christian as the coming again of Jesus Christ. So, can you tell me how many Christians claim to be Christians don't believe in Jesus coming again? All Muslims across the board. In fact, sometimes I take a few Captain Kirks with me and show them the reality. One time I spoke at a church and I went to this coffee shop and there was a, a rabbi and a pastor. It was an Israel event thing, you know. And they were talking to me and they said, you know, we've been coming to this coffee shop all our life. The owner is the Palestinian Arabs and they were so wonderful to us. They're so nice and we had never had a problem. So the waiter comes, he's from the Middle East. And I began to talk to him in Arabic. I said, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as -salam. I said, okay. I began to gossip about these two Captain Kirks sitting in the table. I said, what do you think? You know, I've never seen something like this. I mean, a rabbi with a priest. Can you believe that? What do you think of those two guys? When you speak in Arabic, you'll get the truth. Forget what they say in English. Rule number one. You got to get what they say in the Arabic. I said, what do you think? Uh, the Prophet Muhammad says that the day of judgment is going to come and they're going to kill the Jews and cut their heads off and this and this and that. What do you think of these guys? He says, yes, we will cut their heads off, but we have to wait for the coming of the Mahdi. What did he say? He said, what he said basically is that enjoy the services here. We have hamburgers, french fries, cheeseburgers, steaks. <laughs> You're not on the menu yet. <laughs> Even the most moderate of all Muslims. I was sharing a, a platform with uh, Mr. Woolsey, ex-CIA, just the other day. And they're always looking for this moderate Muslim. Everybody's looking to find a moderate Muslim. In search of the moderate Muslim. This is a book I should even write. I had debates with moderate Muslims galore. I was at a synagogue on Yom Kippur, Judah Jassim. He is a prominent doctor who speaks as a moderate Muslim. And I remember he finished his speech, nice speech, Mr. Jasser. I uh, took him aside, began to talk to him a little bit. I says, Mr. Jasser, did the Prophet of Islam kill the Jews in Saudi Arabia? Now, Remember, every question I ask is a Jesus-style question. You're in checkmate. If, so, if I ask you today questions, realize ahead of time, you're in checkmate. You can't answer the question. I learned that from Jesus. And you ought to learn it too. It's a very good habit. Did Muhammad kill the Jews of Saudi Arabia? If he says no, then he's no longer a Muslim. Because he denied what Muhammad did. He denies the hadith. He denies the annals and the writings of the Islam and the Quran and the hadith. He's no longer a Muslim. Of course, he had to say yes. Question number two. How do you justify it? How do you justify it? He says, well, we all know they had a fair trial. I said, how interesting. How interesting. Europe came to confess that the Jews had no fair trial. Everybody in the world became to confess that Israel had no fair trial except the Muslim world. Even a moderate Muslim. The lie number one is that there is something called moderate Islam. It doesn't exist. Mr. Woolsey, the CIA, just last week, he says, what about Qabbani? Another name he throws in, Qabbani. Qabbani, he's a very moderate Muslim. I said, no, okay, I'll send you some stuff. Qabbani wrote a book on the Islamic eschatology. Qabbani talked about how we're going to usher in a khilafa, which means the vicar of Muhammad on earth. Qabbani wrote about Armageddon. Qabbani wrote about the coming Mahdi. But the Qabbani, who, this, who basically criticizes the terrorists in America, it's because they criticize them because they should not do anything now. They have to wait 
till the Usher two schools of thought. Some say Osama bin Laden is good, some say Osama bin Laden is bad, because Osama bin Laden should wait for the coming of the Mahdi. So when the Mahdi comes, guess what? All your so-called moderate Muslims are no longer moderate. Good luck. Is that how you wanna, is that who you want to stand with? Is that your hope? Is it moderate Islam? There is no such thing as moderate Islam. But why is there moderate Islam? Why is there this whole hoopla and talk about moderate Islam and Islamic democracy and what have you? Well, you have to look at the Bible. Because I'm not interested here to come to you today and talk about Islam or bash Islam or bash Muslims. I'm here today to talk about what the Bible says regarding Islam. Nobody talks about the subject. Everybody talks about terrorism, they talk about it in generic form. Secular speeches, secular books. You go to the bookstore, you buy secular books on Islam and what have you. But there, no, there has not been any books written regarding what the Bible says regarding Islam. This whole concept of the Mahdi, the Antichrist, and how to witness to Muslims from a biblical perspective. So I began to work very hard. I began to write how Muslims become Christians. If I sit down with Brother Kamal and we talk about the Bible, we talk about the Bible a little different than you. Because we see your Antichrist a little different than you. Because we see your Antichrist as our Mahdi. After all, you look at the world today, they say Islam is a peaceful religion. Islam means peace. Your President Bush said the same thing. In fact, President Bush said, we worship the same God. I was stunned. I don't worship the same God. If we worship the same God, then why did I have to leave Islam? Do we worship the same God? In fact, you Americans could have peace with Islam in an ins in a, instantly. You know, you know how you can have peace with Islam? I'll give you a peace proposal that will work 100%. Fourth of July, all the Americans go to the stadiums, the biggest stadiums in your cities. On fourth of July, all the Americans in unison will say, we want Osama bin Laden's peace proposal. What is Osama bin Laden's peace proposal and Ahmadinejad's peace proposal? And every single Muslim clergy, the peace proposal for the Americans is this. That if the Americans say, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger, you'll have peace. How many of you want to say there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger? Raise your hand. Why are you so anti-peace? <laughs> you want wars for not wanting to utter a statement? I mean, how bigoted is this? You're all bigots. Amen. You're all bigots. <laughs> and excuse me, do you think if I sat down the Richard Dawkins of the world and all these anti-Christian writers, Christopher Hitchens and all these Christian phobes in the same hall right here and offer them the same offer, do you think they, they will raise their hand? They won't. They will not raise their hand. They will not accept there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. Why? You know why? Because we're Americans, no one tells us what to do. That's it. We're stubborn Americans. Why are we stubborn Americans? I don't want anybody to tell us what to do. Because our grandfathers bled for this land and they bled for the freedom to express what you want for this land and they bled for the freedom to express what you want, including So now that we're both bigots, whether you're liberal, whether you're conservative, I began to accept this title as a badge of honor. I am a Christian, American, 
fundamentalist, Islamophobic, Kafir, bigot, and a xenophobe. But so are you. It doesn't matter whether you're Christian or not. Because if you want peace with Islam, raise your hands. There's no God but Allah Muhammad is a messenger. But why do we Christians have a problem with there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger? I found that out when I went to a church for the first time, began to speak and had, fell in love with this song. The song talked about Jesus coming in the clouds. You know the song? There's no God like Jehovah. He's coming in the clouds. Anybody can sing it for me? Riding on the clouds. You don't know it? There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God. You don't know that song. You guys need to learn that song. <laughs> Behold, he comes riding on the clouds at the trumpet call, the year of Jubilee. You know the song. And then it says, there's no God like Jehovah. 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 I said, wow, I love this song. But for different reasons than you love it. Because it says there's no God like Jehovah. It doesn't say there's no other gods. There's claiming gods. But there's no God like Him. And Jesus is coming on the clouds, riding on the clouds, coming down to earth. I remember getting in the pulpits and began to ask. Because I see your songs different the way you see them. I see the Bible a little different than the way you see it. I asked a question. I said, do you know when Jesus comes on the clouds, what is he coming to do? Anybody wants to tell me? Come on, raise your hands. You thought there's no quizzes in my class? You're wrong. <laughs> test the spirit. Test the sheep. I test everything, including you. What's Christ doing riding on the cloud? I know judgment. You always give me such generalized answers. Judgment. What? You were in the first service cheating. No problem. It's in Isaiah chapter 19. Isaiah chapter 19. Behold, the Lord rise on a swift cloud and will come into Egypt. Excuse me, why is that significant? Because I am not talking about a battle with a Muslim nation per se, something happens before Jesus comes. No, no, no. I am talking about a battle in which Jesus himself is participating in a war with Egypt. A specific country. In other words, Christ is coming down to earth to pick a fight with the Egyptians. Why? Because they were messing with Israel. So when Christ comes again, he's coming on the clouds to fight a Muslim country. Can you imagine me as a Muslim began to read this? And I go, wait a minute. Every time I talk to Christian Americans, I ask them about this Jesus stuff, they tell me that Jesus is a teddy bear. He loves you. He loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, they're always like peppy and groovy and kind of like, Kamal says, they're like foofy Christians. I said, but reading this, the guy is no teddy bear, the guy is a grizzly bear. And I don't want to run into that guy. You think it's only one incident. Did you know in the Bible, in every single context where Christ is on earth, he is fighting a Muslim country. But the problem, by the time I wanted to reach to the Western mindset and tell them, wait a minute, Jesus is not fighting an Italian. He's fighting Muslims. The door shuts and they don't want to hear it from you. Because they don't want to be confused with what the text says because the books are already on the shelves. Because the Western mindset, when they interpret the Bible or 
prophecy, if I say we're going to have today Bible prophecy lesson, the first thing that comes into the Western mindset is this. Oh, we are going to study the book of Revelation. Why do you Americans always like to start from the last book? It doesn't make any sense. How do you understand all these allegories without looking at the literals? The literals are volumes. So much to talk about the literal parts of what the Bible talks about regarding what talk about the literal parts of what the Bible talks about regarding what Revelation talks about. So you go to Revelation and you begin to read. Woman riding on a beast, having seven mountains and you know, all these things, seven mountains, let's see. Hmm, this looks like Rome, because Rome has seven mountains. So all of a sudden, Rome is in judgment. I know what you think, you're looking at me funny. I know, you're thinking these things. That's, and the EU, you got the EU, that's the Antichrist. The EU began to join into this uh, movement when they began to reestablish a, a European Union. I think you know what I'm talking about, right? You know what I'm talking about. Come on. The tenth nation joined was Greece. I remember, even as a Muslim, I knew about that stuff. When Greece joined as a tenth nation, I said, I bet you them Christians think that's the Antichrist. Sure. And they were all over books galore when Greece joined the tenth nation. That's it. We got the composite of the Antichrist. The end is coming near. All the American prophecy buffs began to write books that the end is near. We have the 10 nation confederacy, the EU is it, then 11th nation join and 12th nation and 13th nation and 14 and 15 and 16. The EU is growing 20, 21, 22. We got 22 toes of that statue of Daniel chapter 2, all protruding from the Western Roman Empire with no toes from the Eastern Roman Empire. Man, that looks like a strange feat. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. <laughs> but no! The Antichrist must come from the EU. That's it. So you go back to the drawing board, you don't know what to do, and you begin to make it fit somehow. Maybe they attend the G8. Ah, oh, the G8 now. Oh, I know what you're thinking. It's the G8. The Pope is going to set up guillotines in Rome and begin to cut heads off of Christians. While the real people who are cutting the heads off are getting away with it. Because Islam is a peaceful religion. Let me tell you something. I can stand here till I'm blue at the face. Talking about the EU. And talking about the papacy. I can pick on the Pope day in and day out. And guess what's going to happen to me? Zippo, nothing. No one's going to pick a fight with me. Catholics don't come to kill you if you pick on the Pope. The EU is not going to come and kill you because you're exposing them as the Antichrist. They look at you as crazy. The real Antichrist is the one that you begin to talk about, that you risk your life. As a Christian, the real Antichrist is something that you're not comfortable talking about. That's the real Antichrist. So you're thinking when you go to the Bible Sunday school, you're studying these things as just something to know. Oh yeah, it's neat. You sit at home and you go home, you come back to service. Wow, how neat. We learned this and we learned that. And you think your whole walk as a Christian is that Jesus bless me now. I know what you Westerners think. That whole concept of Jesus is to bless you abundantly on earth right now. If it's not true what I'm saying, then why is Joel Osteen's church filled? The biggest church in America. Coming there to think about the positive message and the negative message. When the two words positive negative doesn't even exist in the entire Bible. When the two words positive negative doesn't even exist in the entire Bible. Whole doctrines are made up. And you've ignored the Bible when it said... That before the coming of Christ, the falling away must come first. So if you're in the midst of the falling away, look around. Doctrines of demons. Thank you. Christ said, I send you a sheep 
amongst wolves. What is that supposed to mean? Nothing? He sends you as sheep amongst wolves. So if you have no wolves in your life, maybe you're not sheep. I don't know why you're laughing. That's not a joke. If you're not a sheep, then join us and leave us alone for a change to say that Allah and God are not the same. It's not easy to be a sheep. Christ also said, be as wise as a serpent and as innocent as doves. Now I could never work on my dove part. I try hard. But I'm part of the bad people. I don't think I'm good. But I know all about serpentine wisdom. Because I've lived it. And I've seen it. I saw how my father treated my mother. I saw how in Islam they treat women. Antichrist, after all, he says it doesn't desire women. Is that what you Westerners think? Antichrist is a homosexual, you know? He's one of those. Because it says in the text, he doesn't desire women. Where did you come with such a strange concept? The world's going to elect a homosexual? Antichrist is not one of those. It says he doesn't desire, he doesn't honor the desire of women. Excuse me, women, what's your desire? He doesn't honor them. Whatever your desire is as a woman, anything, he doesn't honor it. He don't give a darn about women. Can it be any clearer? Why can't the text just say what the text is saying instead of you putting words in the text? He will attempt to change times and laws. Well, what is Islam? Well, it's a religion. No. Sure, it cloaks itself under religion. Islam cloaks itself with religion. But Islam is Sharia law. Look it up. Sharia law. Sharia law to be instituted throughout the whole world. Wait a minute, Wali. But Antichrist is an atheist. No. False. Daniel chapter 11 is very clear regarding who Antichrist is. Let's go there. Take out your stinger missiles. And get ready. We're going to study the Bible. Look at verse 37. The amazing thing about Daniel when I read it as a Muslim is that the whole concept of Islam is put right there in two verses. Everything. It's so amazing. In verse 37. First of all, we all know that Antichrist, he honors a god of fortress. How does the Antichrist honor a god of fortress? Verse 38. God of war. Who honors a god of war? What is a god of war after all? What's jihad? You know what jihad is? War to honor Allah. Americans, welcome to jihad. Welcome to hudna. Hudna is a peace treaty in Islam that's offered to non-Muslims. Hudna is not even called a peace treaty in Islam. It's called ceasefire treaty. Do you know in Islam, there's no such thing as peace treaty. It doesn't exist. Why? No such thing as peace treaty. It doesn't exist. Why? Because Islam forbids to have a peace treaty with non-Muslims. Why? Because Islam as a concept has to be propagated throughout the whole world by the power of the sword and the war to advance Allah's glory over all the gods, especially Jehovah. Especially the God of the Christians. Especially the God of the Jews. 
Because the God of the Christians, they believe in the Trinity. You don't understand that stuff. Trinity is the most anathema in Islam. Trinity is the most holiest thing in the Bible. God forgives everything except blessing the Holy Spirit. If you deny God as the Holy Spirit, you ain't going to heaven, pal. God is the Holy Spirit. Not the angel that Muhammad ran into, who claimed that he was the Holy Spirit. That's blasphemy. In 1 John 2.22, who is the liar? He who denies that Jesus is the Christ. He is anti-Christ that denies the Father and the Son. Only Kamal is shaking his head because he gets it. He knows. Because Islam as a religion came for one reason alone, to deny the Trinity. So how important is the Trinity? It's a major doctrine. Because God visited mankind through the Son. And then He gives you the Holy Spirit. So He dwells with you. So He guides you to the truth. The only way to reach to the truth is through the Holy Spirit. I prayed in the name of the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob to show me the truth. When you do such a thing, you've dialed the right number and the other side answers and He gives you the truth. That's how it works. You seek Him with all your heart, your soul and your might and He will reveal Himself. I began to see as I studied here, look what it says. He shall regard, verse 37, neither the God of His fathers nor the desire of women. We talked about that already. He doesn't honor the desire of his fathers, the God of his fathers in ancestors. Muhammad denied the gods of the ancestors, of the pagan gods, and he established a god, a single god. Americans think that the Antichrist is a Jew. I said, show me one verse in the Bible that confirms Antichrist is a Jew. They say, well, there is no verse that says Antichrist is a Jew. I said, well, give me some, you know, evidence. Circumstantial evidence, any evidence. Here's the circumstantial evidence Westerners give you that the Antichrist is a Jew. Well, he doesn't honor the God of his fathers. Since it's a singular God, only Jews worship a singular God, so it has to be a Jew. Excuse me. Muslims also honor a single God. And that God they honor is a God of fortress. Jews don't honor a God of war. So that seems to fit. Ah, hold on, Mr. Shubat. Hold on. You have a problem. There's a flaw in your theory. How is the Antichrist going to fool the Jews to sign a peace treaty? Because for them to trust him, he must be a Jew. I know what you're thinking. I've been with you hanging on for a long time. It drives me crazy. Excuse me. They sign a peace treaty with the answer, Arafat. <laughs> he honors a single God and it's a God of war. They sign a peace treaty with him. Why should they sign a peace treaty with Antichrist? Bunch of baloney. These arguments don't hold any weight whatsoever. You make these arguments, I don't know where you get them from, but they hold zero weight. Walid, come on. The Bible talked about Antichrist coming from Europe. Give me a verse. Here you are, a thousand of you, and there is one of me. It should be a fair debate. Come and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Let's reason, right? You Westerners lack reasoning. I didn't used to reason before. I become a Christian. I learned that the first thing you have to do is to reason, not this. So let's reason. Who is to reason? Not this. So let's reason. Give me one verse in the Bible. Give me one verse in the Bible that God wars with a non-Muslim country. One verse. Anywhere. Where? Show me the verses in the Bible that says God is going to usher in this Antichrist from Europe. It really doesn't exist. 
I know he's looking at his wife over there. Wait a minute, Rome, seven hills, seven 200 million man army, China. Come on, Wally, China's in the Bible. 200 million man army coming from China. Why is it in the West that when you have a discussion over prophecy, words are entering into the text that never were in the text? China was never in the text. Why didn't you introduce it in the text? When you argue Bible, the first thing you need to do from an Eastern mindset is bring the exact quote and the exact words. And when you treat the word of God, it's like you're going to court, you know? Objection, Your Honor, you know? It's not part of the text of the law. Overruled. Or Honor, I have DNA evidence. The DNA evidence rules over the circumstantial evidence. And the whole Western paradigm regarding Antichrist is all the circumstantial evidence get, getting the most weight of the argument. Do you know that? It's all the circumstantial evidence. Because there are 200 million man army, so that must be China because of the number of the people. How do you draw such conclusions based on no evidence? First of all, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it says kings of the East. Not one king, many kings. China is only one king. So how did you make kings one king? Kings rule kingdoms. There are several countries, not one country. If there are kings from the east, there are several nations under their kingdoms. Not one king, many kings. From the east of the Euphrates. Remember, they're coming through the Euphrates, right? So if they're coming through, through the Euphrates and there are many kings... That means there are many nations. Second of all, hermeneutically speaking, if there is a fulfillment of a prophecy, it must always take precedence over the one that is not fulfilled if it has the same kind of context. We have kings from the east, or wise men from the east in the New Testament, coming to worship the king in my village. They came with incense, frankincense, and myrrh. You know the story? I'm talking by myself, you look bored. They came with frankincense, incense, and myrrh, and worshipped the king in Bethlehem. All scholars agree that these came from the regions of Persia, Babylonia, and Arabia, and what have you. Guess what? Today all these are Muslim. Oh, hold on, Mr. Shabbat. There's 200 million. We're going to bring 200 million man army from these countries across the Euphrates. Excuse me? Let's go across the Euphrates. There's Iraq, Iran. By the way, these are declaring war already on you. You don't have to wait for the EU. Pakistan, Afghanistan, Indonesia. I can muster easily, not 200 million man army. I can muster 500 million man army. How's that sound for? 100 million man army. How's that sound for a challenge? Try to refute that one. And guess what? I got all the evidence to back my theory because it's already happening. Ahmadinejad comes to the United Nations and he makes a speech praising and praying for the ushering of the Mahdi, the perfect man. Is that not an antichrist? And what about those verses where Christ fights? How does that clock work? I got one minute and 43 seconds because before explosion? Is that all I have? No. Strict Americans, wrap it up. <laughs> Gotta wrap it up. Wally, you got to wrap it up when you're up there. That's all I hear is wrap it up, wrap it up. <laughs> Even the restaurants, wrap it up. In Joel chapter 3, God comes to fight Midian. In Joel chapter 3, here's Christ himself coming to fight Midian. All right? What's he doing coming to fight Midian? In, uh, sorry, in Habakkuk 3. Habakkuk 3 he comes to fight from Mount Paran, from Timan. Timan is Saudi Arabia, did you know that? 
What's Christ himself fighting Saudi Arabia? Isaiah 63. Who is this who comes from Edom with his garment sprinkled with grape juice? You know that one? Is, is that grape juice? He doesn't know. It's blood. Why is it blood? I went over there to Arabia to, to kick some behinds. Naturally, he says it, that he's going there to destroy the Arab world himself. Why do you Westerners change the word Edom to Rome? What gives you that right? Well, we have that right because we assume that the seven hills of Revelation is Rome. Because after all, Rome has seven hills. So, once we looked at an allegory and concluded that allegory means Rome, all the literals must be Rome. How is that hermeneutically correct? How dare you take an allegory, make it the literal, and ignore the, uh, the literals where Christ fights these nations? Isaiah 63, who is he who comes with his garment sprinkled with blood? All over. Psalm 82, arise, O God, judge the earth. He's judging them. Joel 3, I will gather all nations into the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will enter into judgment with them there on the account of my people, my heritage, Israel, whom they have gathered among the, uh, you know, scattered among the nations and they divided up my land. The division of land will usher in Christ's judgment. And then you continue in Joel 3. He's talking to Tyre and to Gaza. Lebanon, Kamal, sorry, your people are doomed. He's coming to fight Tyre, Lebanon. And Gaza, my turf too. I wasn't in Mune either. I'm from the Palestinian areas. And he says, who are you to mess with me, O Tyre, and Sidon, and all the coasts of Philistia, Gaza? Hamas and Hezbollah are there. And you see the stuff happening. And he's judging those two nations in that very context of judging the entire nations. He doesn't forget Hezbollah and Hamas. How amazing is that? You live in a time, my friends, that Moses would dance in joy. God brought Israel out of the land of Egypt 3,000 years ago. But Jeremiah said, The day is coming, saith the Lord, when no longer the children of Israel say that God who's brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but God who's brought the children of Israel out of all the lands where he has driven them, out of the land of the north, and all the lands where he has driven them. From 100 different nations, God brought the children of Israel in front of your eyes. When you read the Bible as a book on stories, forget it. The Bible is not a book on just devotion. The Bible is not just a book on stories. The Bible I began to understand as a Muslim was a book on the destiny of mankind. I've taken Psychology 101, Sociology 101, English 101, but I've never taken Futurology 101. This is Futurology 101. What an amazing document. It's not even a document. It's many documents. Come tonight. I know the thing says zero. <laughs> this is the vegetables. Tonight there will be the T-bone steak. Bring your Bibles. If you don't have time to come and eat T-bone steak, then I have books outside on the table that talks about this in detail. Why I Left Jihad speaks about the prophetic parts. I have another book coming up, which is the most extensive book done in history, regarding what the Bible says about Islam. That is, I put my heart in that book, it's coming up. But if you want immediate information, it's in Why I Left Jihad. And there's also videos. I know Americans don't like reading. He comes to me. Americans don't like reading. We have to do something. Video, video, video. So we made a series of four videos that talks about the whole thing in detail. By the time you finish watching the video, trust me, you'll throw the old model out. You'll bring the new model in. God bless you. Thank you very much.
It has been an awesome, what, three days kind of, sort of, Friday night till now. It's been so great. Some of you are still asking me, even after the break. I kind of made it clear in our last session together, but people are still asking me, what's with this conference? It's so different. Uh, what's with all these speakers? Who are these people? Um, they're the best in what God has gifted them with. <laughs> and, and it's our heart's desire that at these critical days in which you and I live, I wish sometimes, I know that for those of you who attend Calvary here, I can be pretty honest, I guess, about things. But, you know, even still, you'll hold back a little bit. Um, this is our attempt to go about preparing you for the days ahead, should the Lord tarry. I was born and raised at Calvary Costa Mesa. We were always, I got saved in 1977. Pastor Chuck would say, we could be in heaven in 77. And then when we came into 78, he said, it could be great in 78. And then it came into 79, and he said, it could be fine in 79. Always looking forward to the coming of the Lord. I thank God that my Bible teaches me that in 2 Timothy 4, when Paul the Apostle had lived his life, it was then and only then when the Lord had showed him that he was going to die for his faith. He said that the Lord had laid up for him a crown of righteousness. That's a lot of faith, by the way. Paul's head was going to roll. But he didn't care about that in the physical realm because he said, I thank God he's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And not only for me only, but for all those who have loved his appearing. The first time Paul ever used the coming of the Lord in the past tense, that he was going to miss that because he lived, he said things like, we who are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. That's the hope of every believer. If the Lord doesn't come back, then you need to hear, and you needed to hear from these speakers to be prepared. We need to be ready. We thank God that currently in America we can gather together in freedom publicly. Personally, I don't think it's going to be like that for long for the true church. Someone approached me today about some of the information we had available for people to get involved and understand about who's running for office and what you can or cannot do about that. Pastor, don't you think that you should stay out of those kinds of things? No, I do not think. In fact, that's how we got into a lot of problems. We stayed out. But even still, the church has sat too quiet for too long. And the graciousness of God, he's forcing us into a time of growing up, just like any good parent will do to his kids. It's time for us to grow up. And sometimes, like this morning, you hear things that challenge your normal thinking that's comfortable, and it makes you look harder. And so we need to do that like never before. And when this conference comes to an end with Walid, you're going to go, be going back to your states and to your churches and a couple of friends from Canada heading back. And it is important for you to be the salt and the light that God has called you to be, no longer hiding anymore. You can't do that. Your friends, your family members, your neighbors need you to take a stand. See, so Jack, they're going to hate me. They're going to think I'm a fool. We heard it this morning. You're, if you're going to be a lamb belonging to the Lord, there's going to be wolves in your life. But we are commanded to be salt and light. And I thank God for the testimony and for the witness of Walid Shubat. And I also want to have Chuck Missler stand. Because Chuck, just stand. Let us say thank you to you. Just stand. All of your years of faithfulness. God bless you. <laughs> oh. Chuck Missler, Chuck Smith, Dr. David Hawking, and Dr. John Wolverich shaped my Christianity, and I'm grateful. Thanks. <laughs> Here's the rules for tonight. Waleed Shubat, you have one hour. <laughs> After one hour, we have a 10-minute break to go to the bathroom, to catch our thoughts. 
and you come back for another hour. And there. Yeah. <laughs> and then I think after that, if you're willing, questions and answers, you're a brave man. Is that fine with you? Please give a warm welcome again to Walid Shubat. <laughs> Thank you. I thought at first it was one hour. That was it. It was the plans were changed. You know what I was saying? I'll kill you. You know that new cartoonic thing? I'll kill you. That, that little Ahmed skeleton. Oh, good. I got the marker. You know, he was talking about uh, Brother Chuck Smith. You know, I... I remember in 19, was it 79, 80, I walked into Chuck Smith's church as a Muslim in Costa Mesa. We just first started over there in that church. I remember the guy was singing, There's Nobody Like Jesus. And he was saying, Is Muhammad like Jesus? He was singing a rock and roll song. Is Gandhi like Jesus? And you know, as soon as I heard, Is Muhammad like Jesus? I got offended and I walked out. I said, I'll never walk into those Christian churches again. I vowed I'll never walk in a church again. I made a vow to Allah that I'll never walk in a church again. And look at me. <clears throat> Allah didn't keep the promise to protect me from the churches. So I blame Allah. And I also want to thank Brother... Chuck Missler, I was in a conference with Brother Chuck Missler and I was concerned, to be honest, going to speak at that conference because his was a conference probably the second time I was allowed to talk about Bible prophecy. And I said, how will they receive it? You know, Chuck Missler might not like me talking about maybe some different adjustment of our theories regarding the ends of times. I, they might, you know, kind of close the door in my face and, and I'll be kind of ousted out and be pointed at, you know, he's a strange guy with a strange interpretations. You know, you, you worry. You sweat blood. And then I went to the conference and he was so open. It's like, no big deal, Walid, no problem. You're wrong, we accept you. <laughs> he tells me he agrees with me, but I don't know. Americans have a way of saying things, you know. Because I learned very quickly when I came to America, I mean, I was, you know, sometimes inviting Americans to our home, you know, introducing them to some of our foreign dishes. And I remember the first time I invited Americans and I, after they finished eating, I, the first thing, how did you like it? And the first thing that came out of their mouth, I said, it was interesting. <laughs> so I went to my wife, I says, they loved it. They thought it was interesting, sort of like intellectual dish. They just loved it. Finally, I learned what the word interesting meant. <laughs> and I was crushed and hurt. Americans speak with forked tongue. <laughs> but when I read the Bible, I began to also learn that the Americans really look at terminologies in the scripture and they don't get it. So like, you know, maybe I want to go over some parts of the Bible or some allegorical way of how the West thinks. In uh, All right, where are the piece of the notes? Go. Page one. You gonna I got two hours, that's why I'm doing this, you see. That's why I'm doing this, you see. I must have dropped it. Oh well, I don't need those notes anyway. The words in the Bible that, you know, I always have a stickler with Westerners 
is I think I mentioned it in the beginning of the service, in the first, second service, I believe. I talked about the word the mountains in the Bible. The word mountains in the Bible, most Westerners would identify as a literal mountain. You know, so when you go to the book of Revelation and you read, you know, there is a woman riding in a beast and uh, the beast has seven heads. There are also seven mountains on which the woman sits. Now, to Westerners, that become the Vatican or they become, it becomes Rome because Rome sits on seven hills. So the Vatican is pointed out as the harlot. But may I ask, it says seven heads. How are these seven heads? And also it says these mountains are seven kings. So what do kings rule? Kings don't rule mountains. You have made the allegory literal. And you made the literal allegory. Kings rule kingdoms. So there are seven kingdoms on which the woman sits. There are also you know, seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And if you look at all the allegories in the Bible regarding the usage of the word mountain, you'll find them to be kingdoms. In fact, in Daniel 2, I saw the hand, the stone that was cut without hands, smote the image at the feet, and the stone grew to become a great mountain. So the stone is the Messiah. The Messiah becoming a great mountain is becoming a great kingdom, or the kingdom of Christ that fills the whole earth. Pastors, give me that look, now he approves. Because I forgot to say his kingdom rules the whole world. So his kingdom rules the whole earth. So a mountain is a kingdom. In fact, he said if you have faith of a mustard seed, you can move the mountains. Westerners never thought about what that means. They always think, oh yeah, you know, I, every time I go to a conference, I ask Americans, what do you think he moves the mountains? You know, if you have faith of a mustard seed, how can you move the mountains? And I always get such generalized answers. You know, you know, you get through your troubles, you know, your turmoils and your tribulations. Another hand raises up and, you know, it's my mother-in-law. It's my, you know, our debt problem, my financial problem, Christian finance. I mean, all kinds of, you know, different interpretations here. It's like anything goes in the West, you know. You, no, he's very specific. If you have faith of a mustard seed, you can change the kingdoms. You can change kingdoms. You can change governments. Okay? Literal. So when you, once you understand that the Bible is not really an allegoric book, it really means business. It means specific things. The mountains bow to Christ when he comes. The mountains bow to you in the Psalms. The rivers flow to you. Rivers don't flow to the Messiah, neither does mountains bow. You know? God will remove the mountains. He doesn't remove mountains. My sheep scattered through the mountains. Sheep don't scatter. The Jews didn't scatter up in the mountains. They went to countries and nations. In fact, Ahmadinejad, in his speech, he says, an Islam will rise over all the mountains. I can show it to you on video. Everybody in the East knows what mountains is. Mountains are kingdoms. Now that we know the mountains and kingdoms, maybe we can go to the Bible and begin to look and revisit the book of Revelation and all these things. But before we, revi we visit Revelation, when we study the Bible and we talk about Bible prophecy, we don't begin in Revelation. We begin in the literal parts of Scripture. In other words, the mold that needs to be built in order to come up with a paradigm regarding what God wanted and intended to say, the first thing hermeneutically we do is we go to all the literals that were mentioned in the Bible regarding the ends of times. And then we document all these things and then we say, okay, what is God telling us literally? Well, I went through some of the verses. Isaiah 19, the Lord comes in a swift cloud coming to fight the country of Egypt. You see, I don't like allegory. I don't like Western ways that everything is generalized. Egypt is not my credit card problems. Egypt is Egypt. Things are going on in Egypt. What's going on in Egypt? You need to start learning what's going on in these countries. Why is Christ fighting these countries? Egypt has Al-Azhar University. Al-Azhar University is the number one university in the Islamic studies par excellence that graduates Muslim clergy, Muslim scholars throughout the whole Sunni Muslim world. It's huge. Egypt 
is the country where the Muslim Brotherhood began when the Ottoman Khalifat, the Khilafah, well, new term, sorry, Americans, I gotta explain what Khilaf is. Khilafah is the vicar of Muhammad, the Caliphate. As you see, the Pope being the vicar of, the Catholic, of, of Christ to the Catholic Church, so is the Khilafah as the vicar of Muhammad on earth. I mentioned before the Caliphate was wounded in 1924. Muhammad died, the first Khalifa was Abu Bakr, after him Umar, Uthman, all the way down till the Ottoman Empire seized and was wounded in 1924. The Ottoman Empire encompassed the Roman Empire, took over the Roman Empire, if you will, when the Roman Empire ceased to exist in the West, when the barbarian hordes basically dismantled it in the West, it continued for hundreds of years in the eastern parts of the Roman Empire, called the Byzantium Empire. The Byzantium Empire was in Turkey. That was the Holy Roman Empire, remember? And who took over the Holy Roman Empire was the Muslims, Muhammad II. The Muslims with the Caliphate moved into the Roman Empire and the Roman Empire ceased to exist at this point. So that wound wanted to heal itself. In 1928, the Muslim Brotherhood was born in Egypt. And the Muslim Brotherhood began to sprout Islam again to try to revive it again. They never ceased to try to revive this beast again. Never. They never stopped. The clergy never stopped. They continued. And you have the same thing in Saudi Arabia, which you guys call Wahhabist and that kind of thing. Westerners seem to like to, uh, the idea of trying to blame the mess on one party always. They try to pick somebody to label and kind of forgive everybody else. So the problem with Islam is the Wahhabist, you know. There's those Wahhabists down there. It's those Muslim Brotherhood, you know. That's all. You know, Islam is a peace-loving religion. Do you know what I meant when I met Wahhabi Islam kind of thing, when I heard of Wahhabi Islam? Do you know where I heard of Wahhabi Islam? When I came to America. After 9-11. Wahhabi Islam. What, 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 what in the world is that? I lived all my life as a Muslim, never heard of Wahhabi Islam. Never heard of it. Islam is Islam. Where in the world does people come up with this Wahhabi Islam? Of course the Wahhabists in Saudi Arabia are fanatic. They've always been fanatic. Before the Wahhabists, before any of these things, before the Salafis. Islam is Islam. All Muslims, whether Shia or Sunni, believe in the coming of the Mahdi, who will usher in seven years of peace. Though it will be the last seven years in the Islam, in the, in, the, in, the, in the world, basically. The last years before God will judge the world. And somehow during those seven years, the Jews must be liquidated. And the trees and the stones will cry out, there's a Jew hiding behind me. Come on, Muslim, come and kill him. So your Antichrist basically was our Messiah. Mahdi basically comes back in the spirit of Muhammad. Muhammad said, he will have my spirit. Okay, now that we talked about basically mountains as being kingdoms and we can all study the Bible and begin to unlock scripture, that's all you really need. Other things, waters, you know, the woman comes out of the waters. What are waters? Waters, he tells John, multitudes, nations, different tribes and different tongues, different, you know. So this, this ent entity of the, the beast is really ruling in from every different tribe and different tongue. Fish in the Bible. Fish is basically followers. Remember, Jesus says, fish. You will be fishers of men. The same thing with Gog, you know. The scales, you know, the fish will come on your scales and God will put a hook in his mouth. Gog, you know. So you see a lot of these stars. Stars are angels. I'll be, I'll be above the stars of God. I'll be above the angelic host of God. The pride of Satan himself. What else is there? You know, trees. The olive tree is always the Messiah. Why is the olive tree the Messiah? Why did Messiah choose the olives? Why is the olive tree the Messiah? Why did Messiah choose the olives? Because the only way to get the fruit and to get the oil out of the olives is by crushing it. He was crushed for our iniquities. So all the symbolism in the Bible has a meaning, has a very specific meaning. There's reasons. This is why I like the Hebraic Eastern way of thinking. Cut and dry, you know, there's a point for everything.
There's a reason for everything. The cedar tree will be sort of the, the devil or Satan. Lucifer is identified as the cedar tree, the cedar of Lebanon, basically. Some of the nicknames of Antichrist in the Bible should yield an important piece of information because if you look at the nicknames of Antichrist in the Bible, he is called many things. He's called the Prince of Tyre. Now, where is Tyre? Lebanon. Excuse me, if the Antichrist is Italian, why is God calling him the Prince of Lebanon? Why is he calling Al Pacino? Why he calls him the Prince of Tyre? How come this stuff is missing from the interpretation in the West? I've never heard anybody say why his name is Prince of Tyre. Well, that's just a coincidence, Walid. Okay, fine. Why is he called the King of Babylon? Babylon is a specific place, and that is the regions of Iraq and Arabia. Why? Why is he called the Assyrian? Assyria encompasses Turkey, Iraq, a specific region of land. Why is he called the Assyrian? Why is he called Pharaoh of Egypt? Oh, that's just a nickname. Well, why is Christ fighting Egypt then? He's fighting the Pharaoh of Egypt because Antichrist rules these lands. And once you go to the specifics in Daniel, then it's very clear. It says Egypt, Cush, Foot, and Egypt will follow him in submission. Cush is Sudan. Cush is the landmass south of Egypt. In fact, I get this argument all the time. Walid, you challenged America to find a single country that God destroys in the ends of times that is not Muslim. Ethiopia. They always bring that up. Ethiopia. Christian country. Da. I said, sure. Let's go to the Hebrew. The Hebrew uses Kush. Let's go to the Unger Bible Dictionary or any Bible Dictionary you want. Kush, the landmass south of Egypt. I go to the map, show them what's south of Egypt. Sudan. Somaliland. I said, you just picked the most fundamentalist country in the world as evidence for a non-Muslim country. Ethiopia translated Ethiopia correctly. There's no problem with the translation. The problem is with the usage of terms. The ancient Ethiopia from the time of Ezekiel was the landmass of Nubia, Sudan and that kind of thing. That modern Ethiopia was anciently Abyssinia, different country, different place. That's all it is. It's a little simple adjustment. So you go to the Bible and you find all these literal evidence. Isaiah chapter 10 verse 31. Why is he called the Prince of Tyre? Well, God himself, the Messiah Christ himself, destroys Lebanon. Isaiah 10 verse 31. Isaiah 10 31, and Lebanon will fall by the mighty one. The boss himself. So why is he fighting Lebanon? You have only two choices. Either your theory is wrong, or you need to adjust something here. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not here to start a revolution on prophecy. I am not here to pick on Brother Hal Lindsey, or Tim LaHaye, or any of those folks. You know what? I love these guys. Let me tell you why. Because if one thing the great American Bible scholars got right was the issue regarding Israel. No one else did. The American theologians had that so pat down that they're the only ones I was able to focus on to get straight answers about this issue of Israel. Because if I go to Eastern interpretation, Middle East, Israel doesn't matter. Israel is hated. So not everybody has the puzzle correctly. I have a piece, he has a piece, you have a piece, we put the pieces together. In the Middle East you have a saying, I have one good idea, and you have one good idea. Boy, we put them together, we get two ideas. <laughs> What's wrong with that? So don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to say that I'm sorry. No, it is an adjustment, that's all it is. Because we all believe the Antichrist is coming. I'm not coming with new theories here. I still believe in tribulation period, seven years, all these things. Rapture, all these great things, we believe the same thing. It is just an, an, you know, an adjustment that knowledge in the end will increase in time. The closer we get to the end, 
the better the picture is going to look like and we have much better reasons or much more knowledge to put the puzzle correctly together. As Daniel said, seal the vision. For it's been for the end of time, for the time of the end. It's been appointed for the time of the end. It's sealed. So what part of sealed don't you get? If it's sealed, it's sealed until the time of the end. You know, for, they've been trying to unlock these things all this time. Now, am I coming with something new that's saying Islam is involved? No. In fact, I can quote you many historians that thought it was Islam as well. I take people like uh, Lord, uh, what's his name? Who wrote the 70 weeks, uh, he figured out the 70 weeks of Daniel. Sir Robert Anderson. Sir Robert Anderson was a, uh, in Scotland Yard, you know, he was a, uh, an, uh, head of Scotland Yard. He unlocked the 70 weeks of Daniel. He was the first in history to unlock the 70 weeks of Daniel to give you exactly the date and time when Christ came. Amazing stuff. I read some of his writings. And he said, I am not so sure that when the Bible talks about the revival of the fourth beast, that is talking about Rome. He says, it's the Levant, not the Adriatic. It's the Levant, the eastern parts of the Roman Empire, but not the western parts. It's Egypt. It's those countries. I don't think Britain is playing at all or the West is playing at all in this thing. Guess what? He was right. Can one man be right and the whole world wrong? I mean, everybody asks me, are you the only one with that theory? If I say yes, then I'll forget it. I'm writing you off. Can one person be right and the whole world wrong? Do you know what? It usually is the case. If you believe in Noah, Noah was right and the whole world died. What kind of a message do you think God was sending? God was sending a message. You didn't pay attention to Noah. In the end, he went all the way to the bank and he cashed in. He's the only one that survived in his family. So, I pay attention. Now, we can all unlock the Bible together. I can go to, let's say, you pick part of the Bible and we can read it together with this allegoric unlocking mechanism. We can unlock everything. And guess what? We all think in unison. Let's go to Daniel. Daniel chapter 2. In Daniel 2, it talks about the image. Now in California, I don't have to explain that stuff from scratch. That's California. In the Bible Belt, I got to start from the beginning. The hell of gold, what it is, and the silver, and ah, what? Ah. Now, do I have to go through that here? Californians, good. I'm telling you, they're the best. No, you won't hear me go to Texas and say, you guys are the best. And No, I don't play phony baloney. I tell them the truth. You got the gold, right? You got the silver. You got the bronze. You got the iron. You got the toes of iron and clay. Now the gold is which country? Babylon today is what? Iraq. What's happening in Iraq? Mess! You want to know what Antichrist is going to rule? Follow the mess. Then you got silver which is what? Medo-Persia. Right? Today is what? Iran. What's going on in Iran? Mess. The bronze. You know what the bronze is? The Grecian Empire, which is the 1040 window. You look at the 1040 window. Mess. That's the Grecian Empire. Now, the iron, some think it's the Roman Empire, the two divisions. The iron, some think it's the Roman Empire, the two divisions. Well, maybe. But the iron crushes. The thing about the iron or the fourth kingdom is that it crushed all the kingdoms before it, it says. It crushed all of them. The first question I have to my Western thinker is that you claim this is the Roman Empire. If it is the Roman Empire, can you tell me how and when did Rome crush the silver? 
it did not take Iran, the Parthian. It never completely succeeded in trying to take over the Parthian Empire, the Iranian, the Persian. They never crushed all the ones before it. Okay? Never. So, the iron is, guess what? It comes back again. In other words, you look at this composite, you look at the rest of the composites, they match perfectly. In fact, if you look at Revelation chapter 13, in Revelation chapter 13, it tells you about this beast. Verse 2, now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion. In the West, it's, let's see, his mouth of a lion, his blasphemies, his feet of a bear, well, he stomps, kind of like a big military machine. And the leopard, he's as fast as the leopard. I don't know where you come up with this stuff. The mouth of a lion, the lion is a specific composite of a specific empire. And that specific empire was the Babylonian Empire. The lion is Babylon. All scholars agree, whether they agree with my Islamic paradigm or not, they all agree. Right, Mr. Misler? The lion is Babylon. Go ahead, yes or no? No comment. He pleads the fifth. I learned from Americans when they plead the fifth. They're playing politics anyway. So then you have the feet of a bear. Who is the bear? No, it's not. Don't, don't say Russia. Iran, Middle Persia. You're right. It is Iran, the Middle Persian Empire. Well, those are all Muslim. The lion is Babylon. The leopard is the Grecian 1040 window. All that is Muslim. And the bear is Iran, Middle Persia. All that is Muslim. And that's where all the mess is happening. So if Revelation gives you this composite, well, where's Europe? It doesn't have Europe. The Grecian Empire never included Europe. So the very one the West is focused on is the one that's never mentioned in the Bible, nowhere in literal fashion or even allegoric fashion. Even if we accept that this is the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire ceased to exist in the West, but continued to exist in the 1040 window parts. By the way, North Africa, Algeria, Libya, Tunisia, Morocco, Mauritania were part of the Roman Empire. And guess what? They were part of the Western Roman Empire, not the Eastern. So if you want five toes, you can find five toes easily in the African, North African regions with a revival of a Roman Empire. And you can find five in the East easily. So we have the 1040 window, we have the Muslim, and then guess what? There's really five if you look at it. They're not four, they're five. They're four and they're five. Both are correct. Because it tells us there are four. There are also five, because here the iron and the clay seems to be coming out of this, but really it's a revival of the fourth. Okay? Now, the interesting part in looking at this, look what it says. Verse 35. Verse 34. Verse 34, you watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron and the clay, the bronze and the silver, and the gold were crushed together. Did you see that together there? All at the same time? I know that doesn't mean much to you. Let me tell you why that's so significant. Because if this is speaking about history, if this statue is regarding the gold being ancient Babylon and the silver being ancient Persia and the bronze being ancient Grecia, how are they destroyed together? Either the Bible has a mistake or we have a mistake. When it comes to the Bible and us, Guess who has the mistake always? Rule number one in hermeneutics. You're always wrong. <laughs> the whole world is wrong and Noah's right. 
And that's how it is. It says they were all crushed together at the same time. Who crushes them together? The Messiah himself personally will come and fight them. And became like chaff. Threshing floor, wind carried them. The stone struck the image, became a great what? Mountain, verse 35. And filled the whole earth. He became a great kingdom. He's a king ruling a mountain, a kingdom. Boy, it sounds a little different than what you're used to in the West. Things begin to click for a change. God means something specific. So if the stone crushes the image, hits the image at the feet, in the end, at this position, and they will all be crushed together, that means what? That means the ancient Babylonian empire must come back as a power peg in the Middle East. And guess what? They're working on it. You Americans crushed them. Now they're working in Islamic stuff. Sharia Allah is in there. Iran, it's right here, working. Ahmadinejad is threatening the world. In fact, the Antichrist himself, it says in the book of Daniel, he will go against the strongest of all fortresses. What does that mean? He's crazy enough to declare war on the most powerful nations on earth. It's exactly what Muslims do. They declared war in Britain, they declared war in America. So how is it Christ will crush the ancient Babylonian? No, because these come back again. This is Muslim, this is Muslim, this is Muslim. You know, whether the interpretation of the Roman Empire, I don't know. So that means Europe becomes Muslim too. If you want to say that the iron is the Rome, is Europe, then Europe is going to turn Muslim too. But I don't think so. I don't think that's what it is about. Because as we study the Bible, we don't find any literals with the European countries at all. So the Messiah will destroy all Islamic nations coming in the end. In other words, what we begin to understand when we look at these things is that what the West thinks is that the Bible is single-minded. He says something specific regarding one specific stuff, but it does not apply the duality of Scripture. The Scripture is dual. It has a short term and a long term. In other words, it happens again. Okay? If you look at Revelation 13, it sure confirms that. You go to Revelation chapter 17. In Revelation 17, it talks about this woman, Mystery Babylon. Verse 9. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. So, is there an eraser? No eraser. Oh, thank you. Thank you, brother. So we draw seven mountains. One mountain, two mountains, three mountains, four mountains, five mountains, six mountains, seven mountains. You like my mountains? Americans love the art. The panache. There are seven mountains, there are also seven kings. Kings rule kingdoms. So we got one kingdom, two kingdoms, three kingdoms, four kingdoms, five kingdoms, six kingdoms, seven kingdoms, right? Okay, look what it says. The seven heads are seven mountains, are also seven kings. Five have fallen. Huh, who kings? Five have fallen. Huh. Who's writing this stuff? John. John is saying five kingdoms, empires, fell in the past. So John must be sitting on number six, right here. And he's saying five fell. What fell before the Roman? He was sitting on the number six. What fell before that? Well, we know. The Grecian Empire. Okay, Medo-Persia. Okay. Babylon, Assyria, and Egypt. 
boy, the Lord fights Egypt, Antichrist is called Pharaoh of Egypt, Antichrist is called the Assyrian, Antichrist is called the King of Babylon, you name it. He is he is called Gog of the land of Magog, which is, you know, all these things fits the Antichrist kingdoms. Guess what? The woman rides on all seven. They come in the end. The ancient empires of the past come back again because the woman rides a beast with seven heads and seven kingdoms and seven mountains all again coming back again in the end of time. You got it? Five have fell. One is the Roman here. And the other has not yet come. Number seven. The seventh one, he's saying, has not came yet. Okay? Okay, what hasn't came yet? What nation came after the Roman Empire? The Roman Empire ceased to exist in the West. I explained that. Continued to exist in Byzantium, in Turkey. And when Muhammad II took over, it was the Muslim Empire. That was number seven, Ottoman Muslim. The Muslim Empire, number seven. Remember, this had a horn. When this kingdom failed, number one, when number two failed, it took this horn from this one. Plucked this horn, this guy plucked this horn, this guy plucked, you know. Number five had, best, guess what, it had four horns. The Grecian Empire was broken into four. You know, Ptolemy, Seleucid, you know the stuff. And then came the Roman, took away from the Grecian one horn, okay? Then came the Islamic in Turkey and took away the mantle from the Roman. The Roman Empire ceased to exist. Read Gibbons and the Fall of Rome. Tons of reading stuff material if you want to recognize that Roman Empire did fall. Because the Western paradigm insists that the Roman Empire never fell. Why? Because it won't fit the theory. The Roman Empire continue, must have continued to exist. So you have this one horn here. Count them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten horns. In sequence, it's giving you the sequence of the kingdoms. So he's saying, watch out for number seven here. That's the one you need to watch out from. Why? Look at the text where it says. The beast that was and is not hasn't came yet. It's a previous empire, either the Grecian or the Assyrian. But it hasn't risen yet. It's going to rise as the seventh one. Also himself is the what? In verse 11. The eighth and is one of the seven. Hello. He is the eighth. He comes back the same one again. In other words, it's a revival of an Islamic empire. Fractured. Different fractured. Not a whole. Okay? You're not convinced? Then you must go and tell me how Christ crushes the, sto the statue altogether. If you're not convinced, then you need to answer me why in Revelation 13, the body is a body of a leopard, the Greco. It's a Greco-Romano empire. Even the beast has nails of bronze. Teeth of iron and nails of bronze. Nails are fingers. There's not only toes, there's also fingers. Did you know that? It has nails of bronze. Bronze has always been Greco. In fact, if you don't believe me, there's a, a chapter in the Bible that rarely ever is addressed. I love those ones that are rare. Like a rare coin. In Zechariah chapter 9, verse 13. Look what it says. I mean, <laughs> you look at the whole stuff of Zechariah, verse chapter 8. I will return to Zechariah. I will return to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Does that need an interpreter? My job is so easy. I just have to read it for you. That's all. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will save my people from the land of the east and from the land of the west. I will bring them back and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Boy, chapter 9 of Zechariah. You know, he talks about Damascus. Verse 5, he talks about Gaza. Gaza also shall be very sorrowful. The Philistines. 
Chapter, verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation. Then it gets into the ends of times, and it talks about verse 13. For I have bent Judah my bow, fitted the bow with Ephraim, and raised up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece. You see that? Now is Zion a person? No, there's no person named Zion. Zion is a geographic location. God is interested in geographic locations. Because in the West, what happens, the mistake, is that they go, let's see, uh, Gog, Magog, Meshech, Tubal, uh, Gomer, Beth, Tugarma. These are the children of Japheth, you know. So they say, where did the children of Japheth go? Well, they went to Europe, they went to Russia, they went all over, they went to America. Let's go trace where these people migrated to. That's what the Bible is talking about. No! The Bible is about geography, specific locations. The children of Zion are geographic locations. Against the children of Greece, geographic location. Okay? The Hebrew for translated as Greece is Ionia. Ionia or Iowan. Where is Ionia? Greece. Where? Where in Greece? Because Western mindset, when they say, when I say the word Greece to the West, you know what they think? Ding, 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 Zorba the Greek. Athens. No. Forget Athens. Ionia is in Western Turkey. Cyprus is occupied by Turkey anyway. Nobody's helping those guys out. America wants to help the Palestinian PLO terrorists and forget the real friends and the Christians. They don't want to help the Lebanese Christians. They want to help the bad guys. Wisdom of American government? War on terror, my foot. There is no war and terror. It's all politics, you know? It's all a game. Israel has to pay always. They have to pay, why? Why does Israel have to pay? Do you ever think about it? Just as Christ. They have to parallel Christ in everything. They have to suffer. He suffered the same ways. Naked, naked, hungry, hungry, all these things. And look what it says. Look what it says. Verse 14. If you don't believe me, this is about the coming of Christ fighting that region of the north in Turkey. Verse 14. Then the Lord will be seen over them. Wow. I have bent Judah my bow, fitted the bow with Ephraim, a war, and raised up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece. Then his arrows, the Lord will be seen. The Lord will be seen over them. What part of the Lord be seen do you not get? Christ is there on earth. And his arrow will go forth. Is Christ going to use missiles? Sometimes I suspect it very much. After all, Israel developed what they call the arrow missile. Very fast thing, you know. They will hit the nuclear that's coming out of the Muslim country before it even hits the area of Israel. So in other words, when Ahmadinejad develops his garbage and he throws it using a Scud missile, Israel with an arrow could reach over there and have it explode over their own land. Don't mess and have it explode over their own land. Don't mess with Israel. That's what the verse is saying. His arrows will go forth. Like lightning, the Lord God will blow the trumpet and go with, like, with whirlwinds from the, where? South. So if the Lord himself, Christ, is fighting, coming from the south, where is he going? He's coming south, he's going? Good, okay, good. Sometimes it's American geography, little bit. He's going north. But I thought the Antichrist is coming from the west. Why is he going north? Do you know there is no place in the Bible that the threat's coming from the west? It's all from the east, kings of the east, and it's from north. 
and from the south. Nothing from the west. In fact, the ships of Khittim in Daniel, which is translated as the Roman ships from the Mediterranean, comes to fight against the Antichrist. Because the Western mindset thinks that the Antichrist rules the entire globe. Because you're all set on your idea. Antichrist rules the whole world. You're all going to go to the DMV and get computer chips. And if you don't get the chip, guess what? You know, you're not going to buy and sell. I know what you think. I've been spying at you when I was a Muslim. <laughs> I'm serious. That's why I walked in Chuck Smith's church. And the problem in America that you spy at these guys and end up infecting you. So what is it going to be? John, man, he's got the chip. Get a little microscope and look at foreheads with chips. Is that what it's going to be about? Second of all, how many flavors are there? If you go to the book of Revelation, look at the flavors of these marks of the beast and all that stuff. How many flavors do you have? Verse uh, 17. The Revelation 13, verse 16, 17, and 18. He caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark in their, fore, in their right hand and on their foreheads. Wow. That no one may buy and sell, lest he have the mark, or the name, or the number of his name. What's this or? Can you tell me what the or means? This or this or that. If it's 666, six, six, one size fits all, what's the ors? There's reason for those ors. There's different flavors. When you study the Bible, my friend, don't just listen to a sermon. Go to the text, examine each word. Each word. What is that word? And be a stickler over that word. What does that word mean? I want to know what that word means. Sometimes I spend an entire month trying to research what one word means in the Bible. Entire month. And when I get it, Eureka, I got it. Wake up my wife, three o'clock in the morning. Honey, look what I found, the nugget. Uh, I drive her crazy over researching the Bible. The mark or the name or the number. I don't want to go over through the detail, but I must look at one part, the name of the beast. Remember what I talked about a name, because most people think name of the beast. Let's see. What's the elections going on? You got Barack Obama, you got Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama. Yeah, that's it. Let's add it up. Six. It adds up to six, six, six. I found it. And you have all these articles all over the internet. You want garbage Bible prophecy? Go to the internet. It's filled with it. Just put six, six, six and enjoy the garbage. I mean. Hillary Clinton is going to be the beast? <laughs> You've calculated Henry Kissinger, it doesn't add up. You calculated 25 nations from the EU, you know, because it was more than 10, the 10th nation joined us, Greece. The EU is the Antichrist, and when Greece joined the 10th nation, that's it, you got the composite. You know, even great pastors, I don't want to mention names, I get in a lot of trouble. That's it, that's it, it's coming, it's this date, and that date, and all these things. 25 some nations joined the EU. Now, guess what? It doesn't fit. So what is it? It's the G8. The G8. Oh, the Roman Empire. Oh, okay, let's see. The harlot is not Rome. It doesn't sound like Rome, man. The Pope, after all, they're burning his effigy all over the place. The guy kind of like is not... You know, the Catholic Church is losing a lot of money. It can't be fitting. Well, let's see. It's a combination burrito. The Muslims with the Catholics. <laughs> These days, there isn't a single Western prophecy scholar, not one, that says Islam is not involved. They all say it. All of them. I watch Hal Lindsey. I love Hal Lindsey's show. Do you watch his stuff on TV? It's good. He shows a lot of good stuff. He's the one of the few that are showing what's happening in the Muslim world. Even Hal gets it. Brother Hal, he gets it. Somehow Islam's involved, but I just don't know exactly how the whole thing fits together. But it does. 
Where were we? Yeah, the name. The name is what? It's not a name, a literal name. A name, you have to think what the Bible means by name, just like the word mountain. A name. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Are these names? No, these are titles. His name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. Those are not names. Those are titles. If you want to insist on your Western way of thinking, and you want to be so stickly about it, then it says his name shall be called Emmanuel. He must be from Mexico. <laughs> and if you want to insist on your way of interpreting it, Jesus is not the Messiah. Hello? Come on. If Jesus is not the Messiah, what do you do? Go to the mirror. That's the mistake. Emmanuel, it's a title, it's a declaration of faith. That's what it's all about. It's a creed. The creed of Christ. That's what we're fighting over. That's what we're dying over. In the first services, I did an altar call for everybody to accept Islam. I said, anybody here wants to accept Islam, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. And you will have instant peace with the Muslim world. You want to have peace? You can have it right now. I offered that to the church. What a strange church. The pastor Jack Hibbs must have brainwashed the church so much to be anti-Islam and so Islamophobic that they don't want peace with Islam. Not one raises his hand. I prove it to you right now. Anybody who wants to accept Islam, say there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger, raise your hands. You see? Not one. Now here's the question I have. When the rubber meets the road, And they take one of you and they chop their head in front of you. And you see their blood go down the stairs. We've seen that kind of stuff. You're not used to this. You buy your meat packaged in America. <laughs> and you see this. And then I say, next, anybody who wants to accept Islam, say there's no God but Allah Muhammad is his messenger. You still don't raise your hand. I take your wife. What about you? Now, how will you act? Right now, you're joking around. No, oh, okay. Well, when push comes to shove, the question I have is, will you put your head on that chopping block? Anybody who says they put their head on the chopping block, raise your hand. Do you know what? I choose a different tactic. I'll fight. I'll fight. I choose to fight. I ain't gonna let nobody chop my wife's head in front of my eyes. I'm gonna take a dozen of them before they get me down. And that's the American attitude. We're not going to take no mark of the beast. But it take a mark of blasphemy. The mark is the name, by the way. And it's a declaration of faith. That's what it is. It's a creed. Emmanuel is a creed. Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace is a creed. It's the creed that we all died for. It's the creed that your forefathers died for. They bled for it. And those people want you to believe. They bled for it. And those people want you to believe in it. So you have finally peace. And you become subservient to that system. To pledge allegiance to the beast. To give allegiance. That's what it's all about. An antichrist system that people are uncomfortable to even address or talk about. Fearing they're going to be labeled Islamophobes. I ain't worried about it because judgment comes. I did my job. From a terrorist to an ambassador. I'm telling you, that's what it is. He transformed you from a terrorist to become an ambassador. In some of the sticklers in, uh, let's see, Daniel chapter 9. We have six minutes left before we give you a break. Daniel 9, verse 
Because Daniel 9, remember, in Daniel, it talks about in chapter 8, the little horn, chapter 11. All scholars, by the way, agree the little horn comes from the Greco parts of the Roman Empire. The Greco parts of the Roman Empire is Muslim, by the way. Remember, the little horn comes out of the Grecian Empire, out of one of the four horns that broke off the Grecian Empire. Remember, the Grecian Empire doesn't include Western Europe. So the little horn comes out of the four Grecian Empire. Guess what? He doesn't come from Europe. The Western paradigm says, sure, he comes from the East. They don't deny that. They say somehow he immigrates to Europe. He becomes the head of the EU. He lives over there, you know. And one of the other things they back their theory with is Daniel chapter 9. Because in Daniel chapter 9, the prince comes from the Roman Empire. No one can deny that. Right? The prince comes from the Roman Empire. That is Daniel 9.27, 9.26, 9.27. Do we have to go through Daniel 9 and talk about the 70 weeks and how that was all fulfilled? No. You guys know what that is about. 69 weeks, there's one, seven years left. The devil knows there's seven years left. So Muhammad said that the Mahdi will usher in seven years. Everything you see in Islam, they know the Bible prophecy, but it's becomes what is what is unholy in the Bible becomes what's holy. The Antichrist becomes the Mahdi that Islam is waiting for. You understand? Everything is in reverse. The good guys are the bad guys. The one who mistreats women, he doesn't honor the desire of women. Daniel, he doesn't honor the desire of women. He doesn't honor women's rights, period. That's what it means. It doesn't say he doesn't desire women. It's not one of those. He doesn't honor the desire of women. He doesn't care about women's rights. Western thinking is to say, okay, he doesn't honor the desire of women. The desire of women was to bring forth the Messiah. So he doesn't care about the women who want to bring forth the Messiah or something like that. Excuse me. Is there any woman here that has a desire of bringing forth the Messiah? Anybody? Any woman? Have you heard of any woman lately that has a desire to bring forth the Messiah? I've never heard of such a woman. That's the first coming. So why do you keep that hanging till the end? There is no woman who has a desire to give birth to the Messiah. He doesn't honor the desire of women. Stems from the problem in the garden, the original problem between the devil. I will put enmity between the devil and the woman. Sorry guys. He chose the woman. She brings forth the seed of the Messiah. He wants to destroy the woman. He hates the woman. From that perspective, Satan has always hated the woman. What religion today you know that dishonors women more than any other religion in the world? Islam. Islam. He changes time and laws. That's what it says. Who wants to change all the laws of the world? To Sharia Allah, have you googled Sharia lately? You need to google Sharia to understand Islamic law. Most Westerners think that Islam is a religion. Ah! It has a facade of a religion. It's a government system. Islam is a government system to be established throughout the whole world. In fact, Daniel 11, it's very clear, look at that. In verse 37, he shall regard neither the God of his fathers nor desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall exalt himself above them all. But in their place he shall honor a God of fortresses, a God of war. Who's honoring a God of war? Cheat sheet says Islam. <laughs> and a God which his fathers did not know. He doesn't honor the God of his ancestors, in other words. And what does he do? Which his father, he honored them with gold and silver and precious stones and pleasant things. Wow. When I read this as a Muslim, any Muslim who reads this, it's, it's phenomenal. Why? Because Muslims are required to honor Allah by proceeds of your silver and your gold once a year to propagate and advance jihad, the war 
to propagate Allah throughout the whole world. Look up zakah. Have you googled zakat lately? Z-A-K-A-T. Zakat. Google it. Learn more about how Muslims give percentage of their gold and silver. When I read this as a Muslim, it freaks me out. I mean, like, what? Our stuff is in the Bible. But it's not good. <laughs> and what does he do? It says he advances by their place to honor a God of fortress and God which his father did not know. He shall honor him with gold, silver, and stones, and pleasant things. And then it talks about him advancing this God. Where is that verse? I know it's there somewhere. I'll find it in a 10 minute break and I'll show it to you. 39, 39 thank you. He shall act against the strongest. Uh, there it is. Thus, it's right there, the next verse. <laughs> Thus, he shall act against the strongest of fortresses. He declares war in America and Britain and Europe with a foreign god which he shall acknowledge and what? Advance its glory through the war, through these battles, by declaring war against the highest of fortresses, he is advancing the glory of this foreign god, a singular god, not pagan gods, but a single god, a god of war. And the Christ can't be a Jew, my friends. The Jews don't honor a god of war. And don't tell me because Israel must trust the Antichrist. That's why they must, he must be a Jew so they can trust him. I am sorry to bust your bubble. They trusted Yasser Arafat. And he was not a Jew. He was a Muslim and believed in the God of war. Right in front of your very eyes. In Daniel 9, uh oh. Break! Huh? What? Yeah, what? Yeah, break. Break, 10 minutes. Don't go home. Thank you. My biggest focus, really, when I go to universities is the youth of America. Because nobody's paying attention to the youth. If you don't take care of the youth, the devil will. He will. And all what they want to do, just like Nazism, is rob one generation, brainwash that generation, and the rest is history. It's finished. You can destroy America by robbing the generation of this current American youth. And they're all over the universities. Very little ministries are going to the universities and reaching out to the youth. It's so crucial. No one is. The most important ministry, in my opinion, beyond and above anything that we're doing, is reaching to the youth. Every single conference I go, I see lots of gray-haired people. You're not going to last. <laughs> Neither am I. We're going to go. What's going to remain after is our kids and our grandkids and their grandkids. That's who we have to look after. It's a problem. It's an epidemic. If you look at the Christian movement versus the Muslim movement, the Muslims concentrating on the youth. Look at all the Muslim demonstrations. Very young. Where the Christians aren't concentrating on their youth. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Antichrist is captured. He's thrown into the lake of fire in Revelation 19. Yes, but before this happens, you have to fight him. Talk about the marriage supper of the Lamb, you know, in Revelation 19. Now, when the Western mindset looks at these things, they say, you know, well, 
the beast and the false prophet. The beast is an individual. And the false prophet is another individual. Those two individuals are cast into the lake of fire. Well, every place I've seen in the Bible, beasts, really, it is an empire or an entity. Beasts coming out of the earth, it says they are also kings. Uh, is a beast a king? Yes. Is it a kingdom? Yes. All of the above. So you must think about the beast as a king ruling a kingdom. The beast and the false prophet are cast into the lake of fire. If you don't want to agree that the beast is a kingdom with multitude of people, then you must tell me in Revelation 19.7, look what it says. The marriage supper of the Lamb has come and his wife made herself ready. I can argue and say his wife is an individualette. After that, you know, after all, Christ did not fulfill his ministry. He never was married. When he comes again, he's going to have a marriage. And we're going to have a chupa. And he's going to break the glass. I'm going to sing Hava Nagila for him. <laughs> you disagree with me? Why? Because after all, everything is an individual. The beast is an individual. The beast is the Antichrist all the time. Keep poking in that thing. Beast is Antichrist every single time. But no, not necessarily, because the wife, in the very context, is multitudes of people. So it's a lamb coming for his wife, it's a bride, groom coming from his bride, for his bride, and the bride is multitudes from every tribe, nation, and tongue. Same thing with the Antichrist system, from every single nation, tribe, and tongue. Okay? And the supper of the great God, the Western mindset, keeps the marriage supper of the lamb separate. You see, the marriage supper of the lamb, is seven years in heaven, we're having lamb chops. While seven year tribulation for Israel. Supper. Well, when you go to verse 17, then I saw the angel standing in the sun and cried out loud and saying, come gather together for the supper of the great God. Verse 19, well, what's gonna happen in verse 18? That you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men. That doesn't seem to be a supper. That's a supper for the birds. We're also going to join in the supper, in a way, in the battle, in the war. If you don't believe that you're going to be, you know, involved in this battle, get the third service, a copy of the third service that I gave today, talking about Joel 2, Joel 3, all that good stuff, matching it with Psalms and Isaiah 13, and how the saints are going to be with him in the battle and the war as well. We are going to participate in this battle of the great God. Because I only have one day. I can't explain all these things. It takes days and months. Okay? Now, the beast, the false prophet, those two are cast into the lake of fire. Do you know, the beast and the false prophet being cast into the lake of fire, did you know that the Bible tells you literally what that means? All the nations that are involved. Did you know the Bible gives you literally the names of the nations that are cast into hell? With the Antichrist. Did you know that? No. Want to see it? Yeah. Be my guest. <laughs> I know many of you don't believe me because these things are never discussed in the church. It's not even talked about. I don't know. I'm trying to pick a title for my new book. The Bible that was never discussed. <laughs> Open your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 28, 29, 30, 31, 32. It's all there. All of it. In chapter 28 of the Bible, of Ezekiel, 30, uh, Ezekiel 28, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, say... Thus says the Lord, the prince of Tyre, all scholars agree. The prince of Tyre is the Antichrist. Right, Brother Missler? Thumbs up. It's the Antichrist. They all agree. And you say, I am a God. I sit in the seats of gods in the midst of the seas. Yet you are a man and not a God. Okay? Some say this is a historic figure. No, it's not. Let me tell you why it's not a historic figure. Look what it says in verse 10. In verse 8, it says, They shall throw you down into the pit. Do I have to interpret that one? You throw into hell. Same as the beast and false prophet. 
You shall die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of aliens. I thought Antichrist ruled the whole world. Who are these aliens that are throwing him into the pit? Did you know even the very famous parts of the Bible? Can you hear me okay or do I have to be close to that thing? Is that fine? Is that fine? Is it working? Some say no. Does this work? See, is this? You gave me a dud bump. <laughs> Boom. It's not working? Ah, yeah. uh, okay. We have an explosion at last. Okay, good. Where was I? Uh, he was thrown into the pit. Aliens. Aliens are throwing him into hell. How is that if he rules the whole world? Even Micah 5. If you go to Micah 5, stay in Ezekiel 28. We're going to go back there. In Micah 5, put a marker in Ezekiel 28. We're going to get back there. Okay? Micah 5. Thou art Bethlehem Ephrata, although you are the least from the clans of Judah, yet out of you comes the one to be ruler over Israel from his everlasting own. All that good stuff, right? Every Western Christian knows that one. Don't look at your Bibles and tell me what's the rest of the story. Without looking at your Bibles. Can, tell, can somebody tell me what's the rest of the stuff? Because to you, Micah 5 is about the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, a little babe in the manger. You love the sentimental stories, you know. He's a babe in the manger. You sing about, the th about Christmas. You always love the little baby teddy bear, but you forget the grizzly. If you continue, look what it says. Verse 3. Therefore he shall give them up. He'll give up on Israel because they rejected him. Until the time that she who is in labor has given birth. She is not Mary. She is Israel given birth to the state of Israel, then the remnant of his brethren. You see that word brethren? So in Matthew 25, when he judges the nations, I was hungry, you didn't feed me, I was naked, you didn't clothe me. When he judges the nations, I was hungry, you didn't feed me, I was naked, you didn't clothe me, I was in prison, you didn't visit me. When were you hungry? When were you naked? When were you? Just as you did it to the least of these, my brethren, in this case, it's the Jews. They were naked in Auschwitz. They were hungry. The same stuff will happen in the end times as well. The brethren here is Israel. If it's not Israel, then you must tell me, how is it it's talking about going back to the remnant, joining Israel? Shall return to the children of Israel. You see that in verse 3? So the brethren here is relating to Israel literally. And she shall stand and feed it and all this stuff. And then he goes on. Look what he says in verse 5. And this one shall be peace. He is when peace will happen. When the Assyrian comes into our land and when he treads in our palaces. When the Antichrist, here he's called the Assyrian, comes into our land. When he enters into Israel. Okay? Who's, who's saying this? Assyrian enters into our land when he treads into our palaces. Then we, God, will raise against him, the Antichrist, seven shepherds and eight princely men. When was the last time you had a discussion of the Bible about the seven shepherds? Never heard of it, I bet you. Anybody heard of it? I mean, asked about the seven shepherds? I mean, Antichrist rules ten kingdoms, right? Three are plucked out of the root, Egypt, Libya, and Sudan. That's in Daniel, literally mentioned. Kushfut and Libya, sorry, Kushfut and, and, and Egypt, will follow him in submission. They're plucked out of the root. What remains if you remove ten? Seven. Seven righteous kings versus seven unrighteous. Seven versus seven. It's a battle between allies of good forces and allies of the evil forces, just like you had in Nazi Germany. In fact, the Bible says nations from the ends of the world will come to destroy him. The ships of Khittim will come to destroy him. Many parts of the Bible I can show you 
where Antichrist does not rule the entire world. But wait a minute, Walid. What about the parts of the Bible that says all the nations? He will have everybody have a mark on their right hand, forehead. You know, all the nations, they will come, right? They will take these marks. All the nations, including the Americans, all the nations. It's part of all the nations. Americans are going to get marks of the beasts. No. If all the nations means all the nations to you Westerners, because you don't understand in the Middle East, all the whole world really is not the whole world as you think of it. It's as far as the kingdom can go. If all the nations in the whole world means the whole globe, then tell me when Nebuchadnezzar issued a decree, you know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as you guys call them. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know those guys? What happened? Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, issued a decree. And this decree says to every tribe, nation, and tongue on the face of the earth, you must worship the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember that one? To every nation, tribe, on the face of the earth. Did his decree go to the Eskimos, to the Mayans? How far did it go within his kingdom? The gospel will go through the whole earth. You know, this was Paul, I think, talking about that. It didn't go through the whole earth at that time. The whole world came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Did everybody from the world came to hear the wisdom of Solomon? No, it's as far as you can go. It's an expression. Always been in the East as an expression. I can show you example after example where the whole world didn't mean the entire globe. So here, aliens will destroy him. God will raise seven leaders, seven righteous kings. You know, I suspect that America is one of them. I suspect it. Why? Because it says the most terrible of the nations, the most militarily powerful country in the world, will go against the Antichrist. Thus he shall deliver us from the Assyrian when he comes into our land and when he treads into our borders. Okay? It's amazing. So now we go to 28. Ezekiel 28. Look what it says regarding this man. It calls him a man. You are a man and not a God in verse 2. Look what it calls him in verse 12 and 13. Son of man, take up a lamentation against the, kings of, the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. What's he talking about? Yes. You were in Eden, the garden of God, verse 13. Who was in the garden of God? Well, I can't say conclusively. After all, there was other people in the garden of God. There was Adam and Steve, right? <laughs> I'm sorry, Adam and Eve. I know. I never could understand this Adam and Steve thing. I mean, after all, I can look at Pastor, I can look at Keith. I don't see anything attractive. <laughs> Even when you do your workout and you come out with the six abs, you know, uh, eh, you know, it's like disgusting. I, that doesn't look attractive to me. Oh, he's a nice looking guy. No, he's not. I have never seen a nice looking guy ever once in my entire life. You know that? Not once. And I always ask myself, they call it the lust of the flesh. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. It's soft and tender and beautiful. God, how could I want to fall in love with a gorilla? <laughs> I never could understand homosexual. I can never understand. I asked my wife many times, honey, what do you see in me? I don't understand. Every time I look at the mirror, I'm grossed out. She says, honey, you'll never understand. I said, believe me, I'll never understand it. No matter how many times she tried to explain it to me, I don't understand it. How she even give me a kiss? I mean, do you, is there any woman here would kiss Yasser Arafat? I don't know how his wife kissed him. It must have been artificial insemination. Who was in the Eden, the garden of God? It was Adam and Eve. 
And look at verse 14. You were the anointed cherub who covers. Ah, this is not either Adam or Eve. This was the angel Lucifer. You were perfect in your ways, full of wisdom. And the Quran talks about this. The Quran talks about the angel that Muhammad met. It gives the very descriptions. It's in my new book. Amazing stuff. How the Quran describes the Burak was filled beautiful, beautiful, and had all these sort of like uh, uh, stones, and it describes them with onyx and uh, with uh, precious stones, exactly as the Bible. You know, the, 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 the Islam calls the angel that saw Muhammad, the Burak, it calls him the peacock of all angels. Do you ever see a peacock with its feathers? And you look at these beautiful patterns and looks like rubies and everything else. He's the peacock, he's the most beautiful of all birds. A bird in the Bible is always a symbol of Lucifer and the devil. That's why when the harlot is destroyed, the city it becomes a habitation of birds, every unclean bird. Okay, here's the devil, him being a man that has to be Antichrist, he's cast into hell. In verse, in chapter 29, Behold, I'm against you, O Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He's calling the same guy, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, because he rules Egypt. O great monster, verse 3. O great monster who lies in the midst of his rivers. Hmm, that seems like Antichrist, the devil. Verse 4, I will bring you up out of the midst of your rivers, multitudes, nations, tribes, and tongues. Rivers is multitudes, different ethnic backgrounds, different nations, and different tongues. And all the fish in your rivers will stick to your scales. Remember when I talked about the allegory? Fish is followers, the believers, the, the, they're believers that follow them. And look at verse 5, I have given you as food to the beasts of the field and to the birds of heaven. Exactly as Revelation talks about, exactly as Ezekiel 38 talks about. He'll become the food. And then it goes on to talk about all these other nations in chapter 30 of Ezekiel. Look at that, verse 3. For the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near. The day of the Lord is the day of the Lord. Look what it talks about. Verse 5. Ethiopia, Libya, Lydia. All of them. Verse 5. Ethiopia, Libya, Lydia. All of them are cast into the pit, into hell. Ethiopia, Sudan, Kush, Somaliland, Libya, Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, Mauritania, North Africa, all that is Libya. Not just Libya of today. Libya is the Moors, all these, bar the, the, you know, the uh, Eastern barbarians, if you will. Libya, where is Libya? Libya is gobble gobble, Turkey, all Muslim. Okay? Egypt will be destroyed from Migdol to Sayin in verse 6. From Magdal to the Aswan Dam, that will be destroyed. It needs nuclear to destroy all that amount of area. It's amazing. Then they will know that I am the Lord, verse 8. The world will know. The Muslims will know who the Lord is. In fact, in Psalm 83, it says it. They will recognize who the Lord is. They will recognize his name. They shall know his name. What is his name? Emmanuel, God with us. They will recognize his title. In fact, in Isaiah, chapter 48, it's very clear, it talks about the Arab world knowing his name and is telling them what he is about. Isaiah 48, the triunity of God, verse 16. In 48 of Isaiah, stay in the Ezekiel, don't worry, don't, don't. Look what it says, the Lord loves him, he shall do his pleasure on Babylon, and his arm shall be against the Chaldeans. The Lord's arm, whenever you read in the Old Testament, his arm is always the Messiah. Always. His arm is the Messiah. He sends his arm. In Isaiah, in, in Isaiah uh, chapter 53, you know, his arm, look it up. It's called the arm of the Lord. Verse 15, I, even I, spoken, yes, I have called him the Messiah. I have brought him and his way will prosper. Verse 16, come near to me and hear this. I have not spoken in secret from the time, from the beginning, from the time that it was, I was there. From the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And now the Lord God, the Father, and his spirit, the Holy Spirit, the second of the Trinity, 
okay, have sent me the Son, the Trinity, all in one verse in the Old Testament. It's amazing. Can you imagine when I read this as a Muslim? Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God. He's coming against his enemies. He's fighting the enemies of Israel. In chapter 46, before that, look what it says. In chapter 45, 44, 43, you pick it. It's all about Islam. Look at verse 23. That to me every knee will bow, every tongue shall take an oath. All American Christians know that one in the New Testament, that Jesus Christ is Lord. But they never look at the Old Testament counterpart of that verse. Very interesting stuff. Look what it says. In chapter 46, verse 1, Bell bows, Nebo stoops. Who is Bell? Bell is always has been Arthur Jeffrey, the greatest historian in Islam. Bell, Allah is the worship of Bel, the moon god. Bel bows, Nebo stoops. All the crescent moons will bow down when the Messiah comes. He will destroy them all. Because to him the Zadok Ashira poles. Mystery Babylon. You don't believe me? Look at Psalm chapter 83. I know this is sound like, uh, why is he jumping all over the place? Because that's how you study the Bible. You find something and you find the rest of the Bible, what it says about it. God makes it like a puzzle, you know why? Because had he not made it interesting and gave you a little homework, it becomes boring. You read it once, you put it on the shelf, and you forget about it. So he made it in a way so it's never boring. Amen. You understand? Yeah. Our God is not a boring God. Yeah. If you want a boring God, go to the Quran. Have you read the Quran lately? It looks like a manuscript that went through the shredder. And as it came out of the shredder, it was pieced back together. Try to read it. Go home, try to read it. I'm not worried about you reading it. You're not going to become Muslim. You're gonna, but what is this stuff? It's like all over the place. It doesn't make any sense. Confusing. Okay, in this Psalm 83, look what it says. In Psalm 83, he says, remember Psalm 83, the famous psalm? Arise, O God, judge the earth. You shall inherit all nations. This is the Messiah. God doesn't arise from his throne if it's not important. Are you going to tell me he's arising for something that is not important? God? Then he goes in, talks about the judgment of these nations that comes. They form a confederacy against Israel, the tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Hajirites, and all these people come in a confederacy against Israel, and he will destroy them. Look what he says. He says, make their nobles like Z uh, uh, all their princes like Zibah and Zalmuna. Do to them as you did to Midian. Okay? Verse 9, deal with them as with Midian, as with, as with Sisera. Okay? Do to them as Gideon did to Zibah and Zalmuna, verse 11. Do you see this Zibah and Zalmuna? The Western mindset would look at this Zibah and Zalmuna and go, what, what in the world is that? Skip it. <laughs> Don't. In other words, when God arises, that's the Messiah, verse 8, in chapter 82 of the Psalm, he comes to judge these nations, exactly what happens in Joel. He's naming those nations and he's saying, I'm going to do with them exactly what happened to Zeb and Zibah and Zalmuna. That's how he's going to judge these nations, the Muslims. Okay? So what did Gideon do to Zibah and Zalmuna? Remember, how much of the Bible is talking about Christ? All of it. Every single part of it. That's what astonished me about the Bible. Come on, Walid. Joseph, suffering Messiah. David, king Messiah. Okay, Gideon. Warrior. War Messiah. You want to know what the grizzly bear will do when he comes to earth? Study Gideon. It'll open your eyes like never before. Do you know what I get my attitude from? Gideon, my favorite. 
he challenges the prophets of Baal. And he's not very kind about it either. He tells them, what happened to your Baal? Is he out taking a leak? <laughs> it's in the text. It's exactly is in the text. Is he in the bathroom doing his thing? That's what he tells them. God is funny. When the Canaanites, the Philistines, stole the ark, God struck them with hemorrhoids. <laughs> and he put the ark, they put the ark back on the animal and said, take this thing back from us. It's a pain in them. <laughs> God is funny, indeed. But anyway, he's going to do the same thing as Gideon did to Ziba and Zalmun. So you need to say, well, what is Ziba and Zalmun? Where are the stories about Ziba and Zalmun in the Bible? You must go to Judges chapter 8. That's exactly what happened to Ziba and Zalmun as Gideon did to those guys. What did Gideon do to those guys? Look what he did. In verse 21. So Ziba and Zalmun said, rise yourself and kill us for as a man, so is his strength. And so Gideon arose and killed Ziba and Zalmun and took the crescent ornaments that were on their camel's necks. I know you got an NIV and you can't find it. <laughs> Almost every American I ran into. What do you got? NIV. Oh, what is that about? Well, it's thought for thought because I really don't understand the Bible. I want somebody to make me understand it. So thought for thought. Whose thought? Ever ask yourself whose thought? Do you know my Bible? Do you know what it has on it? Commentary? Zippo. Just the word of God. That's it. That's how I read it. I had nothing of that stuff you guys have. See, I mean, I need help. I aid, you know. <laughs> search engine. I use a computerized search engine to search that word. Search engine. I use a computerized search engine to search that word, whatever it is. I go to the Greek and the Hebrew. Don't get me wrong. I'm not against those utilities. But all what you need, Greek and Hebrew, let's see, a good Bible dictionary and the Bible, and you're set. Four books. That's all you need. Maps, good maps, good solid maps. Where's all these places? I don't know where these places are. That's all you need. And you're home run. Home run. Understand what the allegories mean, how to unlock those allegories, and enjoy for the rest of your life. I don't worry about going to jail. For the rest of my life, I need a book. If you give me the Bible, I have, that's enough. In fact, even when I was doing photography, filming with documentary people, you know, every time you get together with people in the media, documentary, they're usually heathen, you know. Uh, what do you think about the Oh, well, you know, we have a, you know, everybody, we all worship the same God, as usual. We all worship the same God. I said, let me ask you a question and tell me honestly. If you're sentenced in prison, and they tell you, all right, let's see. Let me give you the tour around here. There's cell block A and there's cell block B. Okay, you're going to go for the rest of your life. We give every inmate that we have two books. We give them either the Quran for the Muslims and the Bible for anybody else who wants it. Take your pick. The Quran or the Bible. You know, every single Westerner. It doesn't matter how heathen he is. All of them, without exception, chose the Bible. I said, why did you choose the Bible? They said, because it's interesting. <laughs> the other one we tried to read it is very boring. <laughs> Everyone chose the Bible. All right. What's in cell block A? Uh, Christians. What's in cell block B? Muslims. You have a choice. You can go to cell block A or cell block B. Everyone chose the Christian sect. <laughs> the section. Not one chose the Muslim section. Are you racist? Divisive? Islamophobe? No, I really know that if I go with the Christians, things will be okay. <laughs> Everybody knows it. I can pick on the Christians for the rest of my life. Nothing will happen to me. Absolutely nothing. I've done it as a Muslim all the time. Picked on the Christians. We love you. It's great. You go to the Muslims and you pick on them, and it's like, I'll kill you. <laughs> you 
He destroys the crescent ornaments. Now we go to find the harlot of Babylon. Chapter 17. The woman riding on a beast. She has a cup in her hand. Revelation 17. The harlot has a cup in the hand, her hand. First of all, he tells John, the angel, the angel talking to John, he, you know, John is talking here, he's writing these things that he witnessed. He said, the angel took me to the wilderness, the desert, look it up. And there he showed me in this desert, in the place of an empty expanse, a woman riding on a beast. And then he tells him later on, John, why do you wonder what the woman is? I will tell you. Really? Wow, a key to unlock things. He says, the, city, the woman that you see is a city. It's a geographic location. It's a place in a desert. He took John to the desert to show him this vision. I had one objection that says, wait a minute, Walid. Yeah, he took him to the desert, but there he saw the video. That's all he saw in the desert. He saw the video. I said, excuse me. Let me take you to every place in the Bible where the angel took somebody somewhere and took him up to a mountain, showed him the Mount of Zion or the Mount, you know, the Temple Mount. It was a mountain. He took him up on the mountain. He took me to the valley and he showed me dead bones. Valley? That's Auschwitz, man. That's the destruction of the Jews. I will gather all these bones. And he'll make the nation. He'll give birth to it. Amazing. In one day. He gives birth to it in one day. She who is in labor. Fulfilled in Isaiah. And as Israel is in labor, she gives birth in one day to that nation called Israel. Happened in your lifetime. So, the place is in a desert. The woman has a cup in her hand. She is giving the nations what the Bible calls the wine of her fornication. She is fornicating with the nations and she is getting them drunk on this wine and the nations of the earth are intoxicated. She has this in abundance. This delicacy that she has is in abundance. A monumental amount of this wine that's intoxicating the nations. In exchange, she is drinking the blood of the saints. In exchange, the nations are hush-hush regarding all the persecution she's doing, killing the saints and drinking their blood. Give me their blood, I give you that wine that makes you drunk. <coughs> Who? Who's the wine? Oil. Greece. George Bush said America is addicted to oil. Addicted. It's an addiction. It's called mystery Babylon. Why? Because you must go to Babel to understand this whole thing. What was the story of Babel? The story of Babel is that they got together and they said, let us build a name for ourselves. That's the first thing they said. Let's build a name for ourselves. Let's make our name big. Allahu Akbar. What did they do? They took everything they got. Let's take everything we have. What do we have? We got bricks and we got tar, pitch, oil. Let's take the oil and build a name for ourselves. So they took the bricks and they built a zugaret to reach up to God. The whole idea is the pride of Babel. And God confounded them. And God will never allow Babel to be built again. Will never allow this whole kingdom to come. It's never going to happen. Because Christ, just as it said in the beginning, let us go down, God himself, and confound their languages. And God will do it again. That's the second coming of Christ. When he comes, he will confound it, destroy it. He'll never succeed. You don't believe me it's the oil? Okay. First, I'll give you evidence exhibit A. If I forget evidence exhibit B, remind me that I need to talk about evidence exhibit B because I'll forget. Does God use space cadets? The answer is yes. 
He used peach, people with peach, speech impediments. Moses. He'll use a terrorist like Paul. Paul was a terrorist. He killed Christians. He terrorized the believers. He was just like me. Don't ask God how he works. If he chose Paul a terrorist, and he chose Moses who was grown up as an Egyptian and had a speech impediment to re lead Israel, don't question. He, take, he takes a terrorist and he does whatever he wants. You know what? Normally, that's how God works. He doesn't take the seminary guys. They're too proud. In Joel 3, he judges the nations. Verse 2, I will, be, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. We all know that one, right? They have to go to 101. He gathers the nations, the same as Matthew 25. He gathers the nations, he judges them. On the account of my people, my heritage, Israel. Look what he says after that. In verse 2, they also divided up my land. And look what else they did. They have given a boy as payment for a harlot and sold the girl for wine. There's the harlot and there's the wine, both in one verse. In Revelation 17, there's a harlot with the wine of her fornication. And here he says, you sold out on the Jews for the sake of this wine to get drunk. And for the sake of this false prostitute religion, instead of your Bible and your books that I've given you, you chose somebody else. God doesn't like harlotry. You say, well, wait a minute, the harlot of Babylon must be a fallen church. You know, Islam is a Christian cult. Did you know that? Islam started, you know, Islam is a Christian cult. Did you know that? Islam started as a Christian cult. The Marcion, Marcion you know, this denial of the Trinity. Do you know how you figure out a cult? Ask them, what do you think about the Trinity? They don't believe in the Trinity or the triunity of God. Run. Run. Don't even sit around. Get out. The Bible dealt with this all the time. That's the first thing I had to deal with. I had to deal with so many things as a Muslim. Denial of the Trinity. I mean, I was bad. Denial of the crucifixion. Denial of the blood. Hatred of Israel, hatred of the woman, spousal abuse, you name it. My desire of salvation was to blow myself up so I can get my salvation. All of a sudden, come in, gone. I love Jews. I don't know why I like Jews now. I used to not be able to stand them, but I like them. And when they abuse me, sometimes I still like them. Sometimes they can drive you crazy. So here it is. Evidence exhibit A. Look what he says. He goes on to talk about in verse 4. Indeed, what have you to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the coasts of Philistia? Who's Tyre and Sidon? Tyre is Lebanon, Sidon, you know, that's Lebanon. And the coasts of Philistia, Gaza. Who's in Lebanon? Hezbollah. Nasrallah. Remember what I said in the, other, in the first sermon? The second sermon? I said, eventually, he's saying here, who are you to mess with me? The Messiah speaking. Who do you think you are, Mr. Nasrallah, to mess with the best? Who are you to mess with me? You know what's going to happen? The trees and the stones will cry out. Nasrallah is hiding behind me. Come, O Jew, come, O servant of Yahweh, come and kill him, till not one of those people are left. You don't believe me? Look how you il 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 got rid of Nazism. America got rid of Nazism by bombing Dresden. You showed no mercy. I know you Americans. You're nice people. Good morning, sir. How are you doing? You know? <laughs> it's almost like you look at them like, too nice. But you mess with Americans. Look out. I know you guys. Hiroshima, Nagasaki. Anybody else with a lip? No! Sign on the dotted line. Yes, sir. 
Now, can we have coffee and have economic exchanges and industrial exchanges? Sure, Japan is a friend. I know you Americans, you don't fool me with that nicey-nicey stuff. You're like a baseball bat. I always tell the Muslims, don't mess with Americans. You think they're a pushover, but they're not. I know them more than you do. You push the wrong button, and believe me, you'll see grizzly bear. And that's what America is like. Nice people, but don't mess with them. Where was I? <laughs> Evidence exhibit B. You don't believe me that it's the oil. Go to Isaiah chapter 34. You know why I act like a clown sometimes? Because the Muslims always accuse me of being a clown. Since guy's a clown. You know what? I wish they believe I'm a clown. You know why? Maybe they leave me alone finally. <laughs> if I'm a clown, just leave me alone. I'm a clown, right? Then why do you want to kill me? You don't kill clowns. You laugh at them. <laughs> in chapter 34 of Isaiah, look what it says in verse 2. For the indignation of the Lord is against all nations and his fury against all their armies. He shall utterly des destroy them. He has given them over to the slaughter. Wow. They be slaughtered. Verse 4. All the host of heaven shall be dissolved. Is that something small? And the heavens shall be rolled up like a scroll. All their hosts shall fall down to the ground. Look at verse 5. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Indeed, it shall come down on Edom and on the people of my curse for judgment. Edom is in Arabia. Ezekiel 25. From Timan, Tanakh including, Tanakh says from Timan to Didan. From Yemen to Saudi Arabia. That's Edom according to God. Maybe you have a dictionary that says it's Jordan, but you gotta go to Ezekiel 25 and tell me what Edom is in Ezekiel 25. It says it's from Timan to Dedan. You can't escape it. Arabia is in the Bible. It's all over the Bible. He will destroy it. And to the people on the curse of... Can you imagine I read this as a Muslim? This guy means business. He's coming down with a sword. Judgment. Amazing judgment. The stars will... Do you know why he judges them? Some of you might not like why he judges them. But you know the boss says in verse 8. Look what the boss says. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance, the year of recompense for the cause of Zion. You don't like Jews? You're in trouble. In other words, he's saying, I myself personally will come down from a sword with heaven, from the heaven with a sword, and I personally will settle this issue over Zion once and for all. That's what he's going to do. He will do it himself. He's coming down to settle this issue with the Arabs over Israel. It says it right there. You want to say he's not saying this? Okay, it's your problem. Debate it, judgment day with him, and lose the debate and go left. Verse 9. He's talking about this Arabia. What does he do to it? Look at verse 9. Its streams shall be turned into what? Pitch. Pitch. In the Arabic language, the letter P does not exist. We don't say Palestine. We say Palestine. The P doesn't exist in the Arabic. So you can imagine what kind of hard time I had when I read this part of the text. I had to get that P squirt away fairly quickly. <laughs> or else I'll never get a chance to speak from a pulpit. <laughs> Pitch. <laughs> Pitch. Can you tell me what is pitch? Butan. Literally, nachal in Hebrew. Literally, tar. 
Because when you read this, you say, its streams shall be turned into pitch. Sorry, Nakhal means torrents. Streams, mines, underground tunnels. Look it up. Look it up. Go to the Hebrew. Click, 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 click. Read it. It says streams. It's not streams of water. It means torrents, mines, shafts, underground shafts, wells. The oil fields, in other words, will be filled with oil. And what does he do to these filled up underground tunnels and all these things? It shall become burning pitch. Its land shall become burning pitch. Verse 9. Are you going to doubt this? No, it's right there. Simple English, okay? It shall not be quenched night or day. Its smoke shall ascend forever from generation to generation. You know who's not going to like this? Brother Al. <laughs> Al Gore is not going to like this. You are going to sit in your office as an ambassador and knock, knock, knock. Yeah, hey, Mr. Gore, have a seat. I'm, oh, oh, oh. he's furious. You ever see his face when he's furious, he's sweaty from his armpits? He looked like a devil. And he say, Mr. Al, Mr. Gore, calm down now. I don't, you know, this, this, this matter, I know it's a very sensitive matter, I know it's bad for the environment, but it says it burns forever. This is an issue you've got to take with the boss in Jerusalem, but may I suggest you don't go down there. Don't go and tell him that what you think how he should run things. You think about Brother Al, and you say, what's this whole thing with the environment? The sun is heating up, and he the whole thing with the environment. The sun is heating up, and he's blaming the, uh, the economy. Oh, well, you know, it's the factories. We've got to close down our American factories. We can't emit any more fossil fuel. It's bad for the environment, you know. He wants to weaken the nations, the righteous nations of the world. The devil works. You've got to understand how the devil works. He wants to weaken the righteous nations. The Bible even says you weaken the nations. He wants to weaken which nation? The mama bear that watches after Israel. America. But you know, it never works for the devil. It's got nothing to do with fossil fuel. The, the sun novas and supernovas, and it heats up on its own. I saw a whole program documentary on it. That the sun heats by itself. <laughs> Pastor, explain that to me. What did I do? Why are they laughing? The sun heats by itself. It's got nothing to do with the environment. So the devil... You know, he kind of sends his agents and says, you know, to weaken you up. But everything, you know, it, it bounces back on the devil. Let me tell you why. Well, okay, you want to take care of the environment, so the devil is a great environmentalist. We've got to cut down emission fuel, blah, 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 car fuel. So you've got all these liberal Americans sort of, sort of, you know, want to take care of the environment. They don't like fossil fuel burning. Guess what? They want electric cars now. So both parties should be happy, Republican, Democrat, whatever, liberal, fundamentalist. They all want electrical cars later on. It's better for the economy. So the devil knows his time is short. He can't use the wine any longer. So he knows the time is short, so he's moving very, very quick. The sooner you see us coming towards this electric car and all these things, guess what? They're going to move quickly. They're going to try to crush this kind of thing. So as a Christian, you need to work for that. You need to work with the... Other party, you know, these environmentalists, they're okay, a lot of them are okay, they're cool, they're not that bad. There are extreme liberal left, but the majority of Americans, I say, are in the middle. I know you have no hope for America because you see everything going down under. I don't think that way. I'm very positive. I'm very positive for this country. Because this country will eventually wake up. It is what the remnant of Christians will do the way that God will judge this country. You're the remnant. What you do counts. Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, verse 35. And when the city clerk had quieted the crowd, said, Men of Ephesus, what man 
is there who does not know that the city of Ephesus is temple guardian of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Zeus from heaven there is an image because the American West they think image of the beast they think the image is a statue of the Antichrist and everybody goes and worships the statue of the Antichrist no it doesn't necessarily have to be so an image of the beast is an icon that resembles the devil okay and it could be a stone because here in this case in Acts it wasn't a statue the worship of Diana okay Artemis go Google Artemis's picture she has a, a crescent moon on her forehead and the symbol of Artemis that he's talking about is the stone that fell down from heaven an asteroid stone why Satan doesn't have his dominion on earth yet he has not come to dwell in the body of Antichrist but he always wants to build a temple for himself to mimic he is remember rule number one with Antichrist he is Antichrist the Muslims have a place of worship that's a black stone a meteor just like in Acts 19 did you know that 1.3 billion Muslims bow down five times a day to that image in Mecca in the desert just like the Bible says they all bow down to the image of the beast it's happening already it's always been happening Antichrist Westerners when you say Antichrist let's see headache Tylenol Antichrist well he's a guy that comes to say I'm Jesus I died for your sins I'm the one who shed my blood when in reality he wasn't the real guy and he's lying to you guys and he's suckering a lot of people to think he's Jesus that's how the West identifies Antichrist but that's not how the Bible identifies Antichrist that's only half of the equation anti Christ anti is against Christ does he say I died on the cross heck no he hates the cross he denies all these elements blood no way Jose Trinity uh, uh, uh. I kill you no Trinity in his kingdom he is against Christ that's what the Bible says he's Antichrist once you understand he is Antichrist he's against Christ now you begin to understand the proper definition of this Antichrist spirit who is the liar first John 2 22 he is you know he's the one that denies that Jesus came in the flesh he is Antichrist he denies in the father denies the father and the son right that's the spirit of Antichrist and he's already amongst you this stuff has been going on from the beginning now it's culminated in a huge cult Islam is a Christian Babylonian mixture that worship towards the black stone bows down the black stone you have to go once in a lifetime to Mecca and kiss the black stone or go seven times around it and the black stone takes away your sins why because Lucifer wants to be like Christ so he mimics Christ he is against and he tries to replace him so he takes his sins the sins of the world you know how Muslims can get their sins forgiven by going seven times around the black stone in the Kaaba and that supposedly takes the sins of all the Muslims you know why it's the black stone because it sucked up the Muslim sin it became black you don't believe me look at this go to the Google look at the black stone enjoy the read there's so much on the black stone so many things we need to discuss the time is very short Ezekiel we're not done Ezekiel continue the story Libya Lydia Turkey all these countries all of them down to the pit and then he names them 31 Pharaoh King of Egypt 32 one after the other they go to hell and then verse 32 chapter 32 verse 22 Assyria is there with all her multitudes into the pit there is Elam verse 24 Iran all her multitudes into the pit to the lowest part of the earth Muslim 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 verse 26 there is Meshach and Tubal south of Russia into the pit into hell look at this it's very clear verse 29 there is Edom the Arab world into the pit Sidonians Lebanon into the pit 
one after the other, literally mentioned by name, into hell in judgment. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, DNA, including Christ himself, I've given you Isaiah 19, he comes to Egypt on a cloud. I've given you Isaiah 10, 31, Lebanon shall fall by the mighty one. I've given you Habakkuk 3, he comes from Midian, he fights. I've given you Isaiah 63, he fights with his garments sprinkled with blood from Edom, Muslim world. I've given you Ezekiel all over. I've given you Psalm 82, Psalm 83 with all the nations. Jibal, Ammon, Moab, Assyria, people of Tyre. I've given you all this evidence, literal references with Christ fighting. That's DNA evidence. And then you go to the problematic areas. Ezekiel 38. You read this, then you go to Ezekiel 38. You see? The battle of Russia. That's a stickler with Americans. Because that's Russia. No, it's not Russia. If you take Rosh, because the translation, there's two kinds of translation. Chief Prince of Meshach and Tubal. Or Chief of Rosh. Meshach and Tubal. Those are the two translations that we have. Chief Prince of Rush, Meshach and Tubal. Rush is a noun. It's the name of a place. You know what? It doesn't matter which one you want to take. Let me tell you why. It doesn't matter if you take Rush as a place or Rush as a head of, chief of Meshach and Tubal. Or Rush as a head of, chief of Meshach and Tubal. All scholars agree, Meshach and Tubal is in Turkey. It's not Moscow and Tobolsk. If you take Rush as a name or a noun, if you look at every single Bible prophecy scholar, you look at their claims, they say it's Russia. Look at the evidence that they present regarding that claim, they'll give you quotes. They will give you Hesio, they will give you, you know, Macmillan Bible Atlas, the Moody Bible Atlas of Bible Lands, dictionaries, they give you Josephus, they give you all these historians, contemporaries of Ezekiel's time, all the references, take all the references, put them in front of you. Say, okay, here's the references they use to argue that Rosh is Russia. Look at the references. Guess what you'll find? You'll find a shocker. You'll find that all the references they use says that this Rosh is in southern Russia. And what's in southern Russia is the CIS nations, the Commonwealth of Independent States. Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, all the stands, you know. And guess what? For my theory to be true and for theory, their theory to be wrong, Southern Russia must split from Russia proper. And guess what? I won. It happened. There's no longer Southern Russia part of communism. Anybody wants to raise his hand and say that Southern Russia is part of communist Russia proper? They used to be communist? No more. They're looking towards the eastern countries, towards Turkey. All these, Beth to Garma, Gomer. Now, the Western paradigm says this, for that to be true, for, you know, this, this invasion of Russia with Muslim country. By the way, all American scholars agree. They come with Persia, Muslim, you know, with Muslim countries, Libya, Muslim. They agree, all the nations that comes with this Rosh is Muslim. They agree, all of them. But what happens with the Western mindset is they must divorce this part of scripture from Armageddon. Do you know why? Because it doesn't fit the Western paradigm. This must happen before Jesus comes, because when Jesus comes, he will come to fight the Antichrist. Are you with me so far? So this got to be out of the picture. It doesn't match all the stuff we're talking about in the West. It's kind of an oddball. But it doesn't work. You know why? Because this battle happens when Christ is on earth. You don't believe me, ladies and gentlemen of the jury? May I give you some DNA evidence? Look at this. 
In chapter 38 of Ezekiel, verse 17, thus says the Lord God, you are he, regarding Gog, G-O-G, you are he of whom I have spoken in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied for years in those days. Now, why am I saying servants, prophets, why am I emphasizing on this S in the end, plural? If all the prophets of Israel prophesied about Gog, you must tell me, what did Joel say about him? Joel never mentioned Gog. Neither did Isaiah. Nobody mentioned Gog except Ezekiel in the Old Testament. There's a mistake in the Bible? No. There's a mistake in how we're understanding the Bible? Yes. Always take option two. <laughs> always, always, always take option two. Why? Because Gog is the Antichrist. If all the prophets talked about him, then what did Joel say? Comes from the north, the army of the north, I'll remove the army of the north, the locusts, all these things. Oh, another long story. What did uh, Isaiah, he's the Assyrian. Micah, Assyrian. Every single prophet spoke about the Antichrist. You're not convinced? Say, I'm not convinced. Okay, we'll continue. There's few other DNA evidences that by the time you finish reading it, you will be a true believer. You will not laugh at the pastor anymore. In verse 12, to take plunder and to take booty. You see that booty over there? Who talks about booty? She bent it down, will look at you and say, you take him take booty. Read about Islam and booty. Go to the Google, say Allah, Islam, booty. Enjoy the read for the rest of your life. <laughs> booty is also women. Women will be ravished in Jerusalem. That's nothing that, that's, even, the, even the Nazis didn't do that kind of stuff. You know, if you have sex with a Jewish woman, that's a crime in Nazism. In Islam, no, fair game. You are fair game. Your daughters are fair game. Your women are fair game. Guys, maybe you're in the West, not like us in the Middle East. We're a little more jealous than you guys. Touch my wife, I kill you. <laughs> you look at her wrong, I don't like it, I might kill you. That's how we are in the East. We're very protective of our wife. But in this booty thing, everything is fair game. The marriage, your marriage from your wife under the Islamic system will be null and void. Your wife becomes fair game for them to do whatever they want to do with her. You think I'm speaking allegorically? Look at Sudan. What happened in Sudan? Look at what happened to the Nubian women. They chop off the breasts. Look what happened in Smyrna. The last church in the Bible, Smyrna. If I ask Americans what happened to the church of Smyrna, they don't know. Who destroyed the church of Smyrna? The Muslims. They cut the women's heads off. Hundreds of thousands were beheaded in Smyrna in the early 1900s. Ottoman Turkish Empire. Your ignorance of history is no excuse. There was American dock ships right there in Smyrna that did nothing. Zippo, there was peace treaty between the Ottomans and the West. And nobody wanted to kind of affect the balance of the sensitivity of this peace process. And the Christians of Smyrna came to beg you guys, right in the dock, help, help. Sorry, play the music louder. One ship couldn't get out of the dock because the heads of the women and the hair tangled up in the propeller. You can see pictures on Smyrna. You can see pictures galore on Armenian Christians dying, but those are not believers because they're not American evangelicals. They had a choice between Allah and Muhammad and they chose Christ and died. And nobody gives a darn. Nobody gives a darn. Do you ever hear anybody talks about Armenians? Smyrna? Hitler used the same argument. Nobody cared about the Smyrna and Armenians. Why should they care about the Jews? But that's how God will judge us what we have done when we see people, men, women, and children being led to the slaughter like this. It's disgusting. Look what it says. Verse 18. And it will come to pass in the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. Literal 
face of Christ. Angry, grisly. Verse 19. You don't believe me? Keep going. Verse 19. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath, I have spoken surely in that day, there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens... The beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth and all men on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. My presence. Still don't believe me? Okay. Look what it says. You can continue on. Chapter 39. I will make my holy name, verse 7. Known in the midst of my people, Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name any longer. Israel is redeemed. When is Israel redeemed? Only when Christ is on earth. His face, literally. He's in their midst, literally. How could this battle be separate from the battle of Armageddon? Look at that. It's verse 17 in chapter 39. You, son of man, speak to every sort of bird and every... Remember? The merciful of the Lamb, the merciful of great God, eat the flesh of kings, the birds, all these things is here. Assemble yourselves and come gather together from all sides to my sacrificial meal, which I am sacrificing for you, a great sacrificial meal on the mountains of Israel, that you may eat the flesh and drink the blood. You shall eat the flesh of the mighty. Drink the blood of the princes. Exactly. As you shall eat the flesh of the mighty. Drink the blood of the princes. Exactly as we see in Revelation. Okay? You don't believe me? Look what it says here. Look at verse, chapter 39, verse 7. So I will make my holy name known, right? We read that one, right? Continue it. Then the nations shall know, the heathens, they will recognize who God is, that I am the Lord, the Holy One. What's that little word after the Holy One? In. What part of in do you not understand? <laughs> it's not of Israel, it's in Israel. The Holy One, all the Bible, the Holy One of Israel. This is the only place is the Holy One in Israel. Do you know how many times I've seen people give a Bible study on Ezekiel 38 and they skip it every time? The Holy One in Israel, blah, 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 blah. And they make the claims and they give lip service to the reference. This is why studying the Bible is monotonous. It's not like Jack Van Empe will do. Watch the program. He will make the claim. Matthew 25, 15. Different stuff. Then give you the reference. You go to the reference. It's close enough, but no cigar. You got to read the text exactly what it says. Every jot, every word, every tittle, God does not want fluffy Christians. He wants Bereans. Bereans. Are you a Berean Christian? Are you willing to die for the cause of Christ? Are you willing just to give lip service? What kind of a Christian are you? Husbands, are you teaching your wife the Bible? Or is your wife teaching you the Bible? Shame on you. It's your job to take lead. You know, every time I go to a church, it's always a woman that gets us in the church to speak. The guy's sleeping. Always. Esters, I call them. Keith, you got an ester down there? Yeah, we got an ester, a few esters down there. Okay, good. Get rolling. Don't sit around. Get out there and do some work. The esters do the job. Guys? <sighs> Limbo land. Really, you have to learn the Bible, the men. And teach your wives the Bible. Amen. It's your job to lead. And sorry, I know the guys don't like me now. <laughs> if you love your wife, get ready to die for her. If you're not ready to die your wife for your wife, then you're not a good man. Your wife should have found somebody else. <laughs> it's your job to take care of your wife. It's your job to work. To sweat and blood. 
Your wife, her job is to get together with her friends and have coffee. <laughs> and do Bible study. She's got enough headache. I remember the first time I fought with my wife. She said, I'm going to go to my mom's and dad's house. I'm leaving. Fine, there's a door. <laughs> huh, okay. Take care of the kids. Pew. No problem, I can take care of the kids. One day, in hell and back. First problem, Wah! why are you crying? Where's mom? You let her go. All night long, it was hell. Honey, I love you. I finally understood what it takes to take care of children and to do laundry and to get those stains off your underwear. It's a lot of work. <laughs> Daniel 9, the same story. We're out of time. Yes. Pastor, we're out of time. Yes. You guys, you know, I told, I told Walid before the service tonight how exciting listening to him, how much it reminds me of being in Israel and on tour. Because you see things. When you go to Israel on tour, you hear from your tour guides and, and we go through the scripture and everything begins to click because you're seeing it in that world. It's amazing. Let's stand. We're going to pray for him, and you will be on your way. Father, we thank you, Lord, so much for this conference, for all these speakers. But, Lord, we pray right now for Walid. We know that he's a great target in the earth, Lord, with uh, the Islamic threats that are against him. We pray, Father, you'd keep him safe and his family. Father, we pray that you'd continue to use him mightily. And Lord, we thank you so much. We receive and enjoy, Lord, every challenge to look deeper into the Word of God. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you have given us your Holy Spirit and your Word. As he said earlier, to be in prison or to be banished somewhere, to have your Word, we would be free as a bird. Father, I pray tonight, if someone is here that does not yet know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, that they see their sins, their lies, their cheating, their stealing, or their manipulation, or their arrogance, or their pride, their self. If they have not yet come to Jesus tonight, I pray that they would do that now. If that's you this evening, you have heard, you have seen the scriptures. It is this Bible and no other book that foretells the future. And this book also tells us prophetic, first prophetic doctrine of the Bible, that God would provide salvation through the woman, through the seed of the woman. Jesus Christ has come. Respond now to the ultimate prophetic topic of the Bible, salvation. Tonight you can say yes to Jesus Christ. Right where you're standing, right now, you can say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I have been convinced. I have seen and heard of the DNA of the Scripture. And I receive you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior, that you died on the cross in my place for my sins. I give you my sins. Lord, I receive your righteousness. Jesus said to Muslims, to Jews, to Nicodemus, to Hindus and Muslims, Gentiles, atheists, non-believers, evolutionists, religionists, Unless you're born again, you will not see the kingdom of heaven. Tonight, you can say yes to Jesus Christ right where you're at right now. Father, thank you for this time. Bless all those who go their way. And Lord, watch over Walid. We commend him into your hands. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.